few weeks ago, we were discussing the church. And when you mention church, you have to understand the called out body of Christ is really the church of the living God. And it's made up of all people anywhere, whomever they may be, uh, be it Catholic or Protestant, that's been truly born again. If a person has been truly born again, which means to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, they are a member of the church or the body of Christ. And But at the same time, we also have to understand when people think of church, they think of denominations, they think of fellowships, they think of organizations, and they say, I belong to the Baptist Church or the Assembly of God Church or the Church of God or the Nazarene Church or the Methodist Church or the Catholic Church or whatever. Those things are important, and at the same time, they aren't important. That may sound like a contradiction of terms, but really it isn't. They're important in your spiritual growth or the lack of it, but they're not important respecting your eternal salvation. And we sort of jotted down a few things that we believe a good church, whatever the name is on the door, ought to incorporate. The first one is the deity of Christ. The second one is the inerrancy of Scripture. The third one is the new birth. The fourth one is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In other words, a church ought to teach, believe, preach, proclaim, and practice these great cardinal doctrines or practices if they don't, they will be weakened by the amount they omit or eliminate. The next one would be divine healing. The next one, the rapture and the coming of the Lord. The next one, worship. The next one, holiness and prayer. Then soul winning. Then caring and love. All of these are about ten points. Now, the next one on our list would have been the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which normally follows uh, the new birth. And we will discuss that, but we're going to skip down to the rapture and the coming of the Lord. I wanted to get Dr. Hall in on this because he's taught this subject for years and years. And um, and I think it's tremendously important. So I, I pray that it won't confuse you if we skip down. And I know that it won't because we can make it by the help of the Lord to fit. So we will be studying today and maybe tomorrow the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord. And we'll get into some prophetic events and maybe be of some help to you. When it comes to the kaleidoscope of events that is going to take place in the future, uh, the Scripture tells us that, uh, if I can quote the exact Scripture, I didn't, it just came to my mind just a moment ago, that I hath not seen, neither ear heard, the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. But uh, God, but God hath revealed them to us by His Spirit. We are not in the dark concerning futuristic events. I have sat across the table and looked into the eyes of the President of the United States, and I have met with him on more occasions than one, discussing the very things that we're talking about now in brief, trying to solve some of the problems. I don't know what I had to contribute, but we were there with other ministers of the gospel and so forth at times. And... I have interviewed, talked with a number of world leaders, I'll, and I thank God for our present government. I think the Lord uh, has been instrumental in some of the men that now sit in high positions of government. Uh, I believe that. But at the same time, a person really that doesn't know Jesus Christ, doesn't know nor understand the Bible. Dr. Hall, I think it was yesterday's program or day before yesterday, said if a man is not educated in this book, he's ignorant. <laughs> and that about describes it. And the world today muddles about not really knowing the future, not really knowing what is going to take place, what is going to happen. And we hear all types of things that are being discussed. Uh, some say the world is going to meet its doom as the world powers um, clash and thermonuclear destruction. Some say that it won't happen that way. It'll, it'll end as a result of a great ice age that's coming. And others say, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. It's going to heat up until we burn to a crisp. And others say it won't happen that way, that uh, we're going to be polluted to death. And on and on the scenario goes. But the Bible does not leave us ignorant. I don't know what your church teaches. I have no idea. And getting out into the arena, and I use that word broadly, but getting out into among a lot of Christians, quote-unquote, and a lot of people, 
There are all types of beliefs about what the future is going to hold, but I believe that this should be our foundation. I believe it should be our guide. I believe it should be that which we base um, what we teach and preach and practice on. I've been taught that whatever a person believes in the Word of God has to coincide with all the other scriptures and agree with all the other scriptures on that related subject throughout the entirety of the Word of God. You can make up a lot of doctrines, but if they don't all agree, if all these scriptures don't harmonize, you've got problems. And this is what we have today are problems because people don't make the scriptures harmonize when they come up with their particular doctrines. Here's what we teach and believe. You don't have to believe this to be saved, but you do have to believe it if you're going to get your future right. <laughs> and it's this. We believe that at any moment the rapture of the church could take place. Now, the word rapture is not really found in the Bible, but it really comes from the word uh, great joy, great ecstasy of joy, which will be for the Christians that's caught up. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I heard this man say many, many times uh, in preaching camp meetings with him years ago, uh, we've got a lot of Christians today that teach that the church is going to go through the great tribulation period. They teach there will be no rapture at all, or else the rapture will come in the middle of the great tribulation period, or else it will come at the end of it, or whatever the case may be. And uh, he went on to say, and I'll let him comment on it in a moment, that telling people they've got to go through hell isn't much comfort. <laughs> And so the Apostle Paul told us to comfort one another with these words. We believe, first of all, the rapture will take place. Then the great tribulation period, which will last seven years, will begin. And we're going to go into a little detail on all of these things and discuss them, but I'm laying down a, ground, a foundational groundwork at the present. After the great tribulation period, at the end of it, where the battle of Armageddon takes place, we believe that Jesus Christ will come back with all of his saints. He'll come back to set up a literal kingdom on this earth. And he will rule and reign for a thousand years. And every child of God that's ever lived will rule and reign with him. I don't care what church you belong to. If you're born again, you will. And all of those that come out of the great tribulation that are still alive will also go into the millennial reign with him. At the, at the end of the great millennial reign, which will last a thousand years, Satan will be loosed. He will have been locked up. But he will be loosed for a little season. And his sojourn will be very brief and very short. And uh, he will be locked away forever at the end of that great millennial reign. And the earth will experience a baptism of fire at the end of it, where the earth will be changed and renovated by fire, the heavens as well, and so forth. And then God will transport the new Jerusalem out of heaven down to this earth. In other words, change his headquarters from planet heaven to planet earth. And we will enter then, having passed the millennial reign, into the perfect age, which will be ages without end forever and forever. Now I'm going to let Dr. Hall take it up. Go right ahead. Well, I think you've done a beautiful job. <laughs> <laughs> Not much I can do with that. But, okay. Well, uh, I learned it from, from the Word of God, and <laughs> right. you and I learned it together. Right. Well, I, didn't, we didn't, I didn't learn it with you. You learned it before I did. Well, the uh, word rapture is an old English word. It means to be transported, of course, from one continent of one place to another, such as in the case of Enoch and Elijah, they were raptured. Now, what, what's disturbing today, we have a few people out there that's got away from the teachings that actually help make us what we are. And as far as I know, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Four Square, the Open Bible, Pentecostal Holiness, all believe in a rapture before the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. And But we got them today that's attacking the doctrine. I heard a prominent uh, minister here a while back. He went on to say that uh, some lady 50 years ago received this vision or had a dream about uh, going to be a rapture, that it wasn't taught in the Bible. Well, I got a word of knowledge for that old boy because Paul spoke of it over 1,900 years ago and Jesus talked about it and it's in the Bible there. And the rapture is one of the plainest subjects, I think, in the Word of God today is the rapture of the church. Translation of the believers. Now, First Thessalonians 5 and 9, your Bible says, God's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, when Jesus was talking about the seven years of tribulation, Luke 21, 36, he says, Pray ye, be counted worthy to escape all of these things. Not half of them, but all of them. I heard a, supposed to have been a debate a few weeks ago, three or four fellows on there, and they was talking about Jesus coming in the middle of the tribulation. He's coming at the end of the tribulation. Some didn't know when he was coming. But those advocating that he's coming in the middle and at the end, they ended up saying, well, he may come tonight. Well, that's contradictory. <laughs> that's absolutely a contradiction. That shows how much they know about the, about the rapture. And so uh, if they can't pull you through all of it, they'll try and get you through at least three and a half years. But Jesus said, pray be kind of worthy to escape all of these things. The church has to go before the Antichrist is even revealed. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8 teaches there, When he who hinders is taken out, then shall that wicked be revealed. Now, Daniel 9, 27 teaches when the Antichrist is revealed, he'll make a seven-year covenant here with Israel. So the church has to go before the Antichrist can even be revealed. Church is pictured in heaven before the tribulation ever starts, while the... While the Church is mentioned uh, some quite a few times in the first three chapters of Revelation, never mentioned once from the fourth chapter on as ever being on this earth. Now, the other night I heard an argument on the on the the seventh trumpet blowing in the middle of the week. Right. They said, well, you know it blows in the middle of the week. It goes on to say, now has come the time of the judgment of the dead and the giving of the wars to the saints. We have to remember that the announcement was made under the seventh trumpet, but it did not happen there whatsoever, because it goes on to say, when the 24 elders made the announcement, they even made that way back in the fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation, the time has come for Christ to reign and take over the kingdoms of this world. And we know he doesn't do that until at the end of the tribulation. Right. So because it was given under the seventh trumpet, they said, well, here's where the rapture is taking place right here. No such teaching is taught there no. in that verse whatsoever. Right. So there's not an ounce of scripture in the Bible anywhere to teach that the church will pass through any part of that seven years of tribulation. Jeremiah 30, verses 5 and 6 says it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time that God has set aside to deal with Israel. Daniel 12, God told Daniel, which shall come up on thy people, Daniel, not upon the church, but up on Daniel's people. So there's not an ounce of truth in teaching these days that the church will go through any part of that seven years of tribulation. And you gave a beautiful scripture a while ago where Paul said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now, there's no comfort in pulling people through the tribulation. They'd have to get some <laughs> new scriptures, and there's not any. And a lot of saints are being disturbed today because of the people who uh, who are teaching that are, are prominent people today. I heard the silliest explanation, if you'd call it that, and that's coming from uh, our television friend that uh, advocated no rapture, coming out of his deal there. He said, this being caught up, this being caught up, trying to explain how it'd be caught up to meet the air, Lord in the air, he said, uh, when the Lord comes at his second coming, which is at the end of the tribulation, he said, you may be caught up 50 feet, you may go up 100 feet in the air. Now, I don't know what good it'd do to run up here and do a little wheelie and drop back down <laughs> at the coming of the Lord. You, you, you'd miss him anyway if you went up from Baton Rouge 50 feet in the air because he's coming over to Mount Olive. I thought that was the silliest explanation, if you call it that, I've ever heard trying to explain away the plain, simple scriptures that's given in the Bible. Well, I didn't mean to take may over I, all that. No, may I get in and ask him a question or two? I think that would help. On that verse in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, seventh, second chapter, seventh verse, only he who now let it the will let until he be taken out of the way and then explain who that is. You use, another, you use well, the when, word. When he is taken out of the way, Paul, what is the he? Paul used that term elsewhere. Ephesians 2, 15, 4, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith unto the statue of the fullness of Christ, unto a perfect man, and having abolished in his flesh even the law of commandments, contained in order make himself twain one new man. So he spoke of a church as a he there. And Ephesians 1, 22, Colossians 1, 18, 24, he is the head of the church, which is his body. So when he comes for his body, his church will go. And then, the word then is a time word concerning the Antichrist. There, He can't be revealed till we go. 
A lot of people say today, they say, well, don't you think we as Christians will know who he is? Well, now, who do you think Paul's writing those letters to? A bunch of sinners? He's writing that to the saints. We're not going to know who he is. So when his church, his body goes, then shall that wicked why, be revealed. Why will he not be revealed until that happens? Well, his, uh, the, go back to the fifth and sixth verse there, that he may be revealed in his time. Right. He has a definite time to be revealed, and that's not now. This is the church's hour. This is the greatest right. time to get yes. people saved, yes. to get them filled with the baptism yes. of the Holy Spirit, and get them ready to get out of here. Yes, that's Amen. it. Amen. Amen. Okay, he's saying that's the church. Yeah. But yeah. Saying that's a lot of people teach us that's the Holy Spirit. I know they do. But either way, the church is going, you know. So. Well, now, John fourteen 16, I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So you can see right there it's not the church. And John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. You can't be saved out the Holy Spirit. So you have to leave it like it is that the Holy Spirit will abide on the earth forever. You have thousands saved through the tribulation. You have the 144,000. You have the martyrs. And the two witnesses will be here in the middle of the tribulation. They preach in the old time gospel. The two anointed ones. Israel flees into the old city of Peter, the ancient capital of Edom, in the 12th chapter of Revelation. And your Bible said she's keeping the commandments of God and has the spirit of prophecy. So now, you're saying the Holy Spirit will continue to be here Holy during the Spirit Great Tribulation Holy Spirit on the period. earth forever, right on through the millennium, and still be getting the baptism out in the millennium. Does the power of the church, is it a restraining force against this power of darkness? Yes, it is. It said he who hinders will hinder. Thank God for the church, for the television programs, and for the gospel that's being preached around the world. It's keeping, keeping that back. And when this uh, church goes, when, when God's believers leave this earth, born-again Christians, what you've been discussing all week, when his church goes, then shall that wicked, and there's where the devil will take over. How bad will it get? Well, it's, it's, it, as the words fail us to describe it, when God calls the salt of this earth out of this earth, all hell is turned to loose on this earth. Jesus had and, great tribulation, didn't Yes. And woe be unto the heavens of the earth, for the devil has come down among you. The devil will be right here in person during the tribulation. They'll have him with them. Let him have him. We'll be gone. But, Brother John, there are some who's teaching that the church needs to be purged, and they need to be purified. And this is the only way they're going to be purified through a tribulation. No, uh, salvation. When you get saved, you're a born-again believer. You're ready to go. You're eligible for all the gifts of the Spirit. You're eligible for all the things that God has for you. And you're as pure as you'll ever be. You're saved. You're born again. And you're going home. This old idea that we got to go through some of this to make us a little better, that's unfair. They ought to resurrect those who've died and make them go through it too, okay. if it makes you better. <laughs> How do they get this? Where, is it scripture? Do no, they have scripture no, to back they, that up? Or? No. It, uh, what it does, it creates a lot of uh, loose living, Francis. People think, well, there's no rapture. When We're not going to be raptured, so we'll have time. And it creates a lot of loose living, actually, among people. You're exactly it's right. It's a purifying it hope, does. Brother Swagger. Mm -hmm. It's a blessed hope. It's a purifying hope. And if we thought the, the Lord... The is. Yes, yeah. sir. If we thought the Lord's coming in the next three or four minutes, it would change the whole attitude of people. Yeah, it would. It really would. Yeah. I think you wanted to say something before well, I go to something I, I was just going to ask... What do, they, what do they do with that verse then? It says, Let no man deceive you by any means that uh, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. We use that verse, don't we, in terms of a falling away of the church. Well, it's hard to have a revival if you're preaching the falling away. And we believe in revivals today. We don't Agreed. preach falling away. So uh, the scripture belongs on over there to where it's talking about. Now, if you go back to the first verse, I beseech thee, I beg of you, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathered together unto him. That's the rapture. That he be not soon shaken by spirit or word or letter as though from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, that's the second coming. Yeah, that's... The day of yeah. Christ. He said, I don't want you to believe it. We're, we're here at the day of Christ, and Christ has come. He's reigning on the earth. Don't you believe that? Because before that, the Antichrist will be revealed, and the son of perdition, destruction, falling away... All that, right in the midst of Revelation there, in the Tribulation, there will be great revivals and there will be falling away. So this verse time. 3 then refers no, to the Tribulation period. Yeah, it don't refer to us today. These are days of revivals. I had an evangelist one time holding me a meeting, and about the second night, the crowd dropped off like mine did last night here at the... <laughs> 
Of course, they, they had a, another deal going last night that was already announced, cut us down a little bit, but we still had a big crowd, a lot more than I've been used to preaching to as a, as a whole. But anyway, the crowd dropped off a night or two, and then they started preaching of falling away. Said, you know, churches are emptying up, people's forgetting God. So I went to this evangelist. I said, now, I never bother my evangelist. I never say anything to him. You're a good preacher. But now put this falling away over here where it belongs because the very psychology of this thing, you can't have a revival and preaching the falling away. So the falling away is not now. What, where do you think the church is today in I line believe, with Bible prophecy? I believe we're bordering right on this tremendous happening that's going to take place. The rapture. The rapture. The late David Ben-Gurion says all 12 tribes are now represented in Israel. And uh, since Israel's become a nation, Jesus said, you'll be scattered among the nations. You're going to be hated of all peoples. In the last days, I'll gather you back. We've watched all this coming into focus and and 40 other other things coming into focus here. That helps us to realize that we're bordering on this event. And we're made to wonder how much more the Lord will allow us to see before he comes. Yeah. Okay, but John, a lot of people take the book of Revelation after the fourth chapter, and it uses the word elect and so forth a number of times, and they attribute that to the church. And uh, give me your comment on that. Well, you have about three or four, three, four elects in your Bible. Uh, Matthew 24 gives us a beautiful example of the elect. Verse 21, for the elect's sake, he'll bring a halt to the tribulation at the end of the tribulation period. Verses 31 through 33, he's going to send his angels to gather together his elect, which have been dispersed to the four ends of earth. Now, that's not us. That's not the church. The church is already gone. In fact, chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither. I will show you things which shall be hereafter. And the church has never mentioned one time after the fourth chapter of Revelation as ever being on this earth, but is immediately pictured in heaven. So what does the word elect mean in the book of Revelation after the fourth chapter of Revelation? Well, it's referring to Israel. Referring yes. to Israel. Yes, it is. It's speaking of Israel. when he, in, other, in other words, basically, the great tribulation period is for many reasons, but it is basically to bring Israel to God. Right, right. That's what it's for. And when it uses the term the elect, it's speaking of he elected Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right. their descendants, and so forth. Right. Nine out of ten is talking about Israel there. Okay. And if it is not talk if it isn't talking about Israel, it's very plain as it's to made what, clear, right. what it is talking about. So I want to ask the question uh, now you mentioned about Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Holiness, Four Square, but what do the Baptists believe about the rapture? I'm, I'm, I'm asking for information. I really don't know. I thought I knew, but somebody uh, disinformed me the other day. Generally, they're dispensationalists, and they would be, believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I, I thought they did. Yes, that's they that's do. what I thought. Well, what about the Methodists? <clears throat> the old Methodist was post-millennial. They... Catholic. I'm, I'm sorry, Nazarenes about the same way. Please. Yes. Yes. Okay. And Catholics, I don't. I don't think they know anything much about a rapture, do they? I. I'd like to know what your church teaches concerning the future, concerning the rapture, concerning the second coming of the Lord. Now, understand, one does not have to believe, as I believe, in the rapture to be saved, or these brethren or Francis. One does not have to believe in the coming of the Lord exactly as I teach it to be saved. These things, as important as they are, really... Um, do not have an awful lot to do with, do not really have anything to do with one's salvation. However, if we are in error respecting any part of the Bible, we, we will be weakened by that much. And I've noticed, and I want the brethren to comment on this, if a church is confused about anything, but especially about the future, about the rapture, about the coming of the Lord, uh, about the millennial reign, about the Great Tribulation period, about the advent of the Antichrist, and all of these things, they will be also confused in what they do for the Lord. They will be confused in their witnessing for Him in some respects and regards. They will be weakened by the amount of error they believe. We believe that the Scripture is, is infallible, naturally, and very clear in what it teaches respecting the rapture and the second coming. And I want to make it clear, if you don't believe it exactly as I believe it, well, we won't uh, fall out over it. We'll still love each other. But I have to teach what I believe to be biblical truth. And I believe this is extremely important because the Bible has so much to say about it. 
it probably says more, John, about uh, the coming of the Lord than it does about the new birth. Mm -hmm. Am I right in that respect? I would say so, yes. And, and uh, so if it, if it says that much, well then, it's tremendously important because the Lord has a plan. His plan is not shifting and changing from week to week according to what Mr. Uh, Gorbachev does or what Mr. Reagan does or what Mrs. Thatcher does or whomever. His plan doesn't change. It's right on target. And everything is happening and, and being pulled in to what he wants. And uh, it, it may not be what he wants at the present, but the, the final conclusion of it, it will be eventually. Because his plan is going to be realized. It's going to be brought to bear. We believe and teach, according to the Word of God, that the rapture could take place at any moment. Now, a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and some of you know a little bit of what I'm talking about, and some of you don't know what in the world I'm talking about. Well, the word rapture, per se, is not really found in the Bible. Uh, but as, as Brother Hall mentioned yesterday, it, 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 it has a, really a series of meanings. It means to be transported from one place to the other. It also means extreme joy, extreme ecstasy. And Paul outlined it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and I'll quote it again. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, Jesus alluded to the rapture. He never really mentioned it per se, but he did say to pray that uh, we be worthy to escape. And as Brother Hall once again brought out, all of these things that are coming upon this earth, he alluded to it, even though the ones he was talking to probably did not understand what he meant. They did understand the coming of the Lord per se at least after a fashion, but they didn't understand the rapture. Paul introduced it to, under the new covenant, to the body of Christ. And when he introduced it, it was really the first time it was clearly understood. Now, we've got some differences of opinions and some differences of understandings concerning when the rapture will take place. No I don't know when it will take place as far as a date is concerned, but if, if anyone puts it in the middle of the great tribulation period, then we know about when it's going to take place, which I think is unscriptural. But at any rate, we've got a lot of disagreement today over when the rapture is going to take place. We've got some preachers that are advocating that you get you some dried potatoes and dried beans and, and so forth and store it up in some underground cave somewhere. Uh, for the bad days that are coming and the tri great tribulation that's coming because the Christians are going to have to undergo this. This is what they say, whomever they may be. Some of them are friends of mine, to be frank with you, that believe that way. Others teach that there will be no rapture at all, that uh, we'll just sort of gradually go into a utopian paradise and the thing is getting better and better and better and better. Uh, some teach that. I met with one of my friends the other day that, that believed that. Uh, others teach, as I mentioned briefly a moment ago, that the rapture will take place in the middle of the Great Tribulation period. Others teach that it'll take place at the end of it. Some teach, as I said, that it won't take place at all. And and uh, somebody said yesterday, some teach that uh, raptures, I, I never heard of this, but we'll kind of go up in the air a few feet and come back. I'd never, that was a new one on me. I never heard of that one. We teach that the rapture could take place at any moment. We teach it could take place today. It could take place next week. We teach there are no scriptures to be fulfilled before the rapture takes place. There are many scriptures to be fulfilled before the second coming takes place, but not the rapture. And um, uh, that's what we teach. That's what we believe. We believe that uh, the Christian, the child of God, the church, the born-again ones, whomever they may be, will not go through the great tribulation period. Tribulation, yes. The church has always gone through tribulation, and some of it has been extremely severe. Some has not been so severe. But as far as the great tribulation that Jesus talked about when he said there is coming great tribulation such as the world has never seen and, and has never seen before and will never see again, we do not believe the church of the living God will have to go through that because we do not believe that's scriptural. Brother Swaggart, yes. would that be a good spot for you to explain? Excellent spot. The, the difference between the... It has been said, but a little vague, 
the rapture of the church, and you said the second coming. Explain I think, that, John, the difference in the two, please. Well, the rapture is before the tribulation, and the second coming of Christ back to the earth is at the end of the tribulation. One is for the church, the other is more or less uh, bringing the saints back and taking over the kingdoms of this world. Israel's looking for his time when he'll come back to the earth. The church today is looking for the rapture. Now, I might mention those who teach that Christ will come in the middle of the tribulation, they base it on the seventh trumpet. They quote from Paul's writings, we'll go up at the last trump, the trump of God shall sound, and at the last trump, evidently, blows twice there, one for the dead, maybe one for the living. But you couldn't have a first if you didn't have a last. So, I mean, I mean if you didn't have a last, you couldn't have a first. <laughs> but anyway, that goes without saying. they advocate that uh, you're going up in the middle because the seventh trumpet blows in the middle of the week. I remember years ago, a fellow stood up in my service, and he said, you believe we'll go up at the last trump? I said, I certainly do. He said, all right, the seventh trumpet blows in the middle of the week. I said, true. But, sir, that's the, that brings woe and judgment. The trump of God brings blessing. One's before the tribulation. One is at the middle of the tribulation. Altogether different. And when they emphasize the last trump, well, there's three more after that. If you're going to emphasize the last trump, then go on down at the end of the tribulation, because there's when the trump will sound again, the gathering of Israel and all of that. So, and then those who teach will go through all the tribulation. They use Matthew 24, 29. Now, I heard my, my prominent minister on his TV program. That was his strong scripture that we're going through the tribulation. Quote it. Uh, Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn when they see him coming in power and in glory. He went on to advocate. He said, Well, see, where Jesus is not coming until at the end of the tribulation. Well, that's true, Brother Swigert. That's true. That's the right. second coming. But that's his second coming with his saints. Right. Uh, Revelation 19.11, John says, I saw Christ coming on a white horse, and all the armies of heaven followed him on the white horse. But Zachariah that's different 14, than the rapture. Oh, yes. Zechariah 14.5, the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. And old Enoch stood back before the flood, and Jude, uh, and Jude well, there's only one chapter there, and Jude, the first chapter, <laughs> 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 he, he prophesied, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, you have to get up there before you can come from up there. And this little bunch is always going through the tribulation. That's the silly stuff I've ever heard. How are you going to come from up there if you never get up there? You'd miss the judgment seat of Christ. You'd miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. You'd miss all of those yes. things because you're staying here on the earth. If if you believe the saints have to go through the yes. great tribulation right. period, you will miss the, the judgment seat of Christ. You'll miss the marriage supper of the miss Lamb. Miss all of that, right. And so, you, you can't come back if you haven't gone. That's a good thought. Yes, May sir. I make a statement here? If I'm talking yes. too much, stop me. But Seven years between those two coming. All right. <clears throat> this tribulation period, uh, where does it start? Now, what, what starts the tribulation? Is, does it go a long period of time long before it gets into it? Is it true that when the church is taken away, that is the starting of the time of Jacob's trouble? Is that is that, is that the, the starting point? That that's is it. That's when it starts there. We would say when God's people leave this earth, that's it. All hell is turned to loose. And then shall the wicked. Yeah. Be it may be next week before he'll make the covenant with Israel. It might be two weeks. It might be the month. But anyway, it starts right then. When he forms that covenant with Israel, that's Daniel's 70th week. Daniel 9, 27. He'll confirm the covenant from one week, which is seven years. And when he sets himself in the temple, announces himself to be God in the middle of the week, Israel will see that he's a deceiver, and they will break from him then. And it's more severe for even for Israel. From a practical standpoint, Brother Hall, I, would you describe what would happen on this set if the trump of God sounds and we're all going up? On this, uh, on this set. television set we're yes. on right now? Yes. Well, we'd take out of here. We'd. I think I can get up through that ceiling there, but... <laughs> But uh, we'd uh, rise to be with our Lord. Now, how fast we'll leave the earth, uh, it doesn't say. If uh, the word uh, rapture says being caught up, how fast we'll go, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I've heard stories. We'll be walking along, and all at once we disappear. Nobody saw us go. They wondered what happened to us. Now, you don't read that in the Bible. 
You have Elijah back there, told Elisha, said, if you see me when I go. He watched him leave this earth. He got up so far, threw the mantle back down to him. Jesus here led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, they watched that distance begin to widen between his feet and this earth. They watched him go on up into the clouds. They'd been able to probably see him longer if it hadn't been for the clouds. Now, the two witnesses that appear in the middle of the tribulation, Enoch and Elijah, preaching the gospel the last three and a half years of the tribulation, while their enemies beheld them after this killed, they stood up, and while their enemies, sinners, was looking at them, they watched them go. They watched them go. You can see them. Now, if there's any similarity between that and the rapture of the church, we'll be setting in services, because there'll be church going on somewhere in this world, and all at once, people will start to rise. And if, you're, and if you're not moving, that could jar you a little bit out there. <laughs> so you're saying that uh, it, the word changed is not necessarily referring to changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. No. It's uh, referring to our body right. as far as its location is concerned. Nowhere does it say you'll be raptured in a moment in a twinkling right. of an eye. First Corinthians fifteen fifty one. We'll be changed, be glorified yes. in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Are you glorified saying that you don't believe we'll dis what'll happen to clothes and yeah, rings what about and jewelry? Suit you've got on. What, well, what? I'm not worried about this old suit on this television. You've seen it every day. I don't know what'll so. happen to it. Now that's you gotta think of that. I what will this, happen to clothes? I hope this girl will buy phone. me a new one when I get off of here, so they will want me back. Well we're not. Oh I see. Well okay. <laughs> <laughs> I took the joy out of that. But uh you don't worry about those clothes, Brother Miller. In fact, uh, well, that suit, you take wouldn't have to me. lose much sleep on that suit anyway you've had. Well, he's fight. trying to say, will they drop to the ground or will it go with him up? I don't, I don't want to take the thing with me, but uh, what will I, Now, that's... Well, evidently, happen. you haven't been in any the, of these services where you can lose weight immediately. <laughs> the guy says, grab on to your... <laughs> What will happen to all that? We'll be given the robe of righteousness. We'll be clothed with the different clothes. And I, I'm willing to let this suit go. Oh, I am too. At the rapture. Okay. All righty. May now, I read? I'm sorry. No, let me read uh, Paul's emphasis upon the importance. Because we're, 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 what we're trying to point out to people is the importance of them believing this and your church believing it. Because it is going to happen. And the emphasis Paul put it on. Let me interrupt you a moment, Glenn, if I will. It, it is important, but I'd, I'd like to know in the churches in the land, all of them. Let's let's all Pentecostal churches, Baptists. We just we alluded to it a moment ago. Methodist, Catholic, the whole bit that goes under the heading of Christianity, where whether it is or not. Um, how many believe in a pre-trib rapture, a pre-tribulation, or the rapture taking place before the Great Tribulation period? Would anyone have any, in other words, they believe what we're teaching. How many would, would teach that? You, 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 do you have any idea, Dr. Sequoia? I do. And we'll do most of the, I know most of the, Pen not all, but most of the Pentecostals do believe this. Am I right, John? Oh, yes. Our doctrines, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, I think the Pentecostal Holmes Church of God, Four Square Open Bible and Seminars of God, believe in a rapture before the tribulation. Now, that's individuals who get out there and advocate you're going through the tribulation. Yes. yes. Uh, okay, but most of the Baptists believe that too. All right, but I am sensing something, and I want you all to comment on it. There is not nearly as much preaching and teaching, and I could be wrong in this, but I know the Lord's impressed me to preach on it a lot, but I, I'm not hearing it much. And not as much preaching and teaching on the rapture and the coming of the Lord as it used to be. That's the truth. That is the truth. Is what, right happened, what has happened to our churches since this has Drawing yeah, back. okay, right. Okay, that's the point I want to make. He brought it out yesterday yes. because the looking for the rapture helps us to walk clean yes. and pure before the Lord because we may be changed at any moment. Yeah. And, Amen. uh, and if, if, if the church has no clear picture, that's what I'm trying to lay down here, no clear picture of what we can expect from the Word of God re re concerning the future, it, it seems like that lends itself toward licentious living, loose living, um, and, and it's not a desire to stay close to God. First Thessalonians 5.21. Look at, uh, uh, at 1 John 2, the last two verses. Those all refer to that. Yes, quickly. But, but yes, but am I, am I right? I'm, I'm asking the question. I'm not trying to get an agreement here or a disagreement. I just want to know. Well, Jimmy, are the, the churches teaching the rapture and the second coming as much as they did 30, no, 40 years I ago? I think I'd say not. Now, you know, in the earlier days, I made this statement. Of course, it's not accurate, but I've often said we had about four sermons. 
salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, hellfire and brimstone, and the rapture of the church, and we shook more devil out of people with those four sermons, and they're doing books. You're right. Yes. So you're yes. right. But looking at church history, the churches that have started sliding back in their effectiveness have ceased to preach the rapture of the church and getting people converted and being evangelical and treat, trying to reach these people with the gospel message because there's an urgency about us who believe that Jesus could come any moment. We want to get as many people saved right. as we possibly can in the shortest possible time we can. All right. Are our pastors out there, are they, are they, I know some of them are certainly, but as a whole, are they slacking off? I believe through, they are. Through neglect Sorry. or through, or maybe inadvertently. What do you know about it? Well, I think it's, I think it's more than just not preaching the, the doctrine of the rapture of the church. I think we're missing it in a whole lot of other areas. We're talking about this one right now, but you're right. Well, yes, that's true. That certainly is correct. But, but I think, I think if, if we don't preach the rapture of the church as much as we should and we preach a doctrine of holiness, I think that church is going to maintain its walk. Oh, I yes. think it, I think yes. it definitely, the Bible says he that hath his hope in himself purifies yes. himself even as he is pure. So there yeah. is a, a purifying effect to the to the coming of Jesus. This may answer part of your question, but uh, as you know, I do a lot of traveling, coast to coast, in and out of the country. And would you believe that in the full gospel churches, and I'd like to name the name, but I won't, I've preached the rapture and people come up to me and said, Brother Hall, that's the first I've ever heard of this. That was going to be yeah. my next point. That's the first I've ever heard. And I said, what church do you attend? They said, well, this one here, this is all I know. I was saved in this church that I've never heard anything on the rapture. And then I just scream inside. I think, my Lord, what are we preaching today? Do, do we have a flock of, of Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Holiness, Foursquare, even Baptist and Nazarene and so forth? that the people attending our churches have never heard of the rapture. If it is, it's some illusion that they don't really know or understand. It's not being preached or taught from behind many pulpits. Not all, but many. Exactly. You said it. Let me read these. May I read these scriptures? Yes. I Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, so on and so forth. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. John says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at coming. In Titus 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself peculiar people. So those scriptures over and over again tell us to look for it, yeah. be ready for right. it, be right. waiting for it. This is what it's all about. When I was a kid coming up, I, I, on the program earlier this week, I told how I got saved. From that moment on, it seemed like half the sermons the preachers preached. Yes. Yes. The evangelists yeah. preached. Maybe they didn't know anything else. I don't know. But man, it was hammered into us. Get ready. The Lord is coming. The rapture is about to take place. Jesus is coming. It, I'll admit it was 10 years before I understood the difference in the rapture <laughs> and the second coming. And I'm not certain a lot of those preachers understood the difference. But that, but anyway, the, the, the intent of their message got through to me. Let me ask and, you a question. Why is the wholeness message not being preached? And I don't mean exterior wholeness. I'm talking about living right and walking with God. Why is it not being preached like it used to? Well, I think a lot of the things um, I, well, let, let me put it this way. John mentioned yesterday about the falling away, and certainly he's, he's right. That's, that's, that refers to the great tribulation period. But I believe the spirit of that falling away is already in this world. Yeah. The apostle Paul said the spirit of the Antichrist was there when he wrote the, the, those words 2,000 years ago, even though he had not been, um, given out to the world. But that spirit of the falling away, and you've, you've got a lot of these great cardinal truths, and doctrines that have gradually been eliminated because we've gotten into other areas, Jim. We've gotten into the area today of, um, of uh, higher education to where that we have left the great cardinal fundamental truths. He brought it out beautifully. Yes. We, we had just a little old simple message. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have had more, but it's salvation by the blood of Jesus, baptism in the Holy Ghost, good godly living, which included divine healing, and the coming of the Lord. 
Yeah. That was about it. We got more people saved and got more hell stirred up and demons That's scared. Right. <laughs> but nowadays the message is more self-improvement. Yeah, self-improvement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Self-improvement. Do this and you'll make a million dollars. Do this and you're going to get rich. Do this and you're going to have a better home. Do this and whatever and whatever. And those old-fashioned doctrines he just mentioned will help us to have a better home, more, yes. uh, a, a better home, a, a better life, less nervous disorders than anything else we could ever have. Here's the I way believe. Peter puts it. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets of the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. They're saying because of scoffers and people who speak lightly of it, or where is it hasn't come. I want to make it clear, Glenn. I think the tenor of the Word of God, the, the tenor of it, the tone of it, constantly sets the stage really for is. the Christian to be constantly looking for the appearing of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. And if that is not taught, that creates a spiritual weakness. It, does. it creates an erroneous attitude. It creates a position that is really untenable according to the Word of God. Really is. And uh, if you teach that he's not coming until a certain time, middle of the tribulation period, or after it, or not at all, well, then you're not, you, you, are, you are subtracting from that spiritual tenor laid down in the Word of God that I, I think it's full of it. You've read it there over and over again. And uh, I think if we if we go opposite of that, we're hurting ourselves very. And get very out much. of that church that doesn't preach this thing. I'm saying that you're not. I'm saying the paper. Get out of it if they don't preach this truth of the revelation, the coming of okay, Christ. Okay, I've got thirty seconds left. Is it possible? Oh Lord, I shouldn't say this. I don't guess. I went off the air yesterday in a terrible way. I don't want to do it again today in the week. But is it possible if we get all confused on this that we may get confused? You brought it out. Uh, you had it in another way. We may get confused on holiness. We may get confused. I believe. That. Okay, I, I think so too, because I think all of this ties in together. And one of the reasons we don't have the holiness that you mentioned, and we're not preaching it, we're not talking about it, that, that closeness to the Lord, that nearness to the Lord, is because he's not coming now. That's right. Blessed he delayeth his coming. He delayeth his coming, and we're in trouble. We believe and teach, and when we got into it last week, I learned more about it myself, and I think the Holy Spirit impressed me even more. So with the fact, that if a church does not understand or believe in the rapture of the church and the second coming of the Lord, that church is going to be somewhat spiritually weakened and will not complete the total embodiment of the great doctrines of the Word of God. Here, here's what we're learning, and it, it's, it's, it's upsetting to me and it bothers me, and I'm digressing a tiny bit before I involve Dr. Hall in the panel. I believe that the rapture of the church is a cardinal biblical doctrine. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We believe that is... That is when Paul gave the great teaching of the rapture to the church. We believe the rapture could take place at any time. Any time. It could take place before this telecast is concluded. We believe there are no scriptures to be fulfilled before the rapture could take place. There are many scriptures that must be fulfilled before the second coming will happen and take place upon this world and Jesus comes back. But there are two great differences in the rapture and the second coming. Two, two differences, uh, what am I saying? Many differences in these two comings. Um, but we're finding that many of the preachers, the churches, and the preaching today does not include the rapture and the second coming as um, it used to. This is disconcerting. It bothers me because I feel this is erroneous. I feel like that, that and, and our pastors and our evangelists and our Bible teachers that are eliminating and omitting uh, this tremendous doctrine. I feel like that it's weakening the body of Christ. Uh, secondly, it, 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 it causes many, many people to um, 
just not look for the coming of the Lord anymore. That they're not really looking for it as I did when I was just a boy. And I think this creates a lack of spiritual awareness because one of, one of the great facets, I think, of living for God is for a person to be constantly looking for the soon and imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's paramount. I think we must understand that. Okay. And last of all, we have a lot of preachers and I think it's becoming more and more, and sad to say it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, that are completely ignoring, and not so much ignoring, but literally denying the rapture, saying that it will not happen. There's no such thing as a rapture, etc., etc., etc. So this is what we're facing today, and I think this is the reason that we must discuss this and must, must do so at length. Because even though many of you that watch this telecast know exactly what I'm talking about, more than likely, more than likely, more do not understand it than do understand it. So that's the reason we're taking the time that we're taking. All right. Here's what we want to discuss, and here's what we want to do right now. This is going to shock you a little bit, uh, and it's this. There are and will be more raptures than one. We all think of one great general rapture, but there will be more than one. And I want Dr. Hall to, to give us the scriptural setting for the raptures and when they will take place, basically. The main rapture that we're concerned with is the rapture of the church. Now, this is a time when all the dead in Christ shall rise first. That goes all the way back through the Old Testament. And then the New Testament saints, those who have died and gone on to heaven. First, I might say, when we die, we immediately go into the presence of Christ, Second Corinthians 5 and 8, Philippians 1, 20 to 23. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said, I'm betwixt two, have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, this will help you to understand. Here's people in heaven. And a lot of people ask this question, Brother Swagger. They say, well... If you die and you go to heaven, how is it that you can have a rapture? Good how point. can you have a resurrection? Good point. Talk right. about it. And, well, you, when you die, you immediately go to heaven. Then Paul made a statement. He said, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, those asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, you're in heaven, but at the time of the rapture, the spirit and soul will return to this earth and will unite with the body. And that fulfills 1 Corinthians 15, 38, which says, God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed its own body. So there we have the resurrection of the righteous dead, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. At this coming, we are meeting him in the air. Now, this is the main general rapture. This is the one we're all looking for. And you're saying God gives that person a body right to every seed its own body that's at the rapture here that's a, and that's the same time when this corruptible speaking of the dead puts on incorruption and this mortals put speaking of the living puts on immortality and then paul said then shall be brought to pass that saying death is swallowed up in victory <clears throat> O death where is thy sting because you won't have to die if you're living when jesus comes you'll be changed in a moment the twinkle of an eye so, O death, where is thy sting? You won't have to go through the sting of death. And, O grave, where is your victory? Because the trump of God sound, you couldn't hold the dead any longer. I'm sure you had meetings similar to this one. I remember years ago, I was teaching up in, I believe it was Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Canada, having a meeting there. And a dear brother stood up in the service. I was teaching, you won't have to die if you live when Jesus comes. So he stood up in the service. He said, Brother Hall, he said, you're wrong on your teaching. So, see, I've been told I'm wrong a lot of times. <laughs> A lot of times I demand chapter and verse, and that makes it a little different there. But anyway, he said, you're wrong on your teaching because Hebrews 9, 27 said it's appointed the man wants to die. He said, now at the rapture, when Jesus comes, the first thing he's going to do is kill us. Ooh. Then he's going to resurrect us. I, I've never heard that one. That's yeah, a new one. Yeah, it? but I've got a lot of new ones. I don't dare to tell them all to you. <laughs> but, but he said, the first thing he's going to do is kill us. And the audience, they got a roar out of that one. I said, audience, take a look, and I gave him chapter and verse. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall be changed. We which are alive be changed. So he said, I didn't bother us anymore. 
It is. It's appointed unto man wants to die, but the rapture is the exception. That's where Paul was showing a mystery that we won't have to, won't have to die if you're living when Jesus comes. So there's the main rapture. All the dead in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23, they that are his will go at the rapture. And we, Excuse me now, that you mentioned it, but I want you to, I want you to talk about it again for a moment. Who will this main rapture include? Well, it includes the Christians. All the dead in Christ who have died and all the living saints will be caught up. This is born-again believers. All the way back to Adam. If Adam ever got back to God or not, we don't know where Adam and Eve ever got saved or not. They fell from grace. Some things thought he couldn't, but he did. And so, <laughs> and Paul used those very terms, wherefore ye are fallen from grace. So Paul would be out of order with some people, but Lord help us not to get in that. But uh, anyway... All the dead in Christ and the living saints will be caught up, and they that means they that are his, they that's born again. Now, Christians uh, are going to leave this earth. If you're saved, you're going. So that's the main one. Now, following that, you have, uh, you have four more raptures. You have the rapture of the 144,000 Jews sealed right after the rapture of the church, and they're protected through the trumpet judgments, they're raptured in the middle of the tribulation, known of as the man-child of Revelation 12. And they're not to be hurt by the plagues, and they're sealed and protected. Following that, you have the martyrs. John looks and he sees a number that no man could number of all tribes, kindreds, tongues, peoples, and nations. Revelation 7, verse 9. Verse 14, he asked one of the elders, Whence are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And he said, Sir, these are they that came out of great tribulation, having washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, there's your martyrs. And if you recall, under the fifth seal, John saw those martyrs up there. And they cried, How long, holy and true, will thou not judge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And he said, Rest a little season, till your fellow servants should be killed. So white robes were given unto him. There's a point there I'd like to insert there. Uh, if you notice, those souls were fully conscious. Nowhere in your Bible does it teach soul sleep. Right, right. They were fully conscious in heaven. Luke 16 is a concrete example after death. It's fully conscious. Why don't you explain what soul sleep mm -hmm. is so in case some of the folk don't know what you're well, talking about? Well, a lot of people, we have our friends out, out in the West there, <laughs> according to where you listen to this program. Lord, it could be West anywhere, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, a lot of people teach soul sleep. You don't know anything. Soul's unconscious and all that. And no such teaching in the Bible. You mean after death? After death, yes. So uh, the souls are fully conscious after death. They either go to heaven or hell. <clears throat> so so Paul was making the mention of those and John there in, the, in his writings in Revelation. Now, this group of martyrs, they'll all go up near the end of the tribulation. They'll, they'll rest a little season until a fellow servant should be killed, and they'll all go up together. So you got the rapture of the church. Before the tribulation, the rapture of the 144,000 in the middle of the tribulation. You got the martyrs near the end of the tribulation. And then you've got the two witnesses, two men in heaven now that God has up there and going to dispatch back to the earth in the middle of the tribulation, preach the gospel for three and a half years. They'll be killed. Who are those two men? Well, go ahead it, and tell us. There are two men who have never died. Mm -hmm. And they're in heaven. In fact, four men went to heaven. Two stayed. Two came back. Those will be back a little later. You have Enoch and Elijah up there. And God's taking care of them. If you need to be fed and all of that, he's taking care of those two men, natural human beings in heaven. And did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that flesh and blood can't enter heaven? Nowhere does it say he that. He said can't inherit the kingdom can't of inherit. God. Can't inherit. First Corinthians 15, 50 said flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you know there's a difference between enter and inherit. Mm -hmm. I entered the bank the other day, but I haven't inherited it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I won't until I get over in the millennium. <laughs> so there's a difference. Anyway, that completes the, that's the first, that completes the first resurrection. So when Jesus arose, you have a rapture there. You have a rapture of the church. Before the tribulation, the rapture of the 144,000 in the middle of the tribulation, the rapture of all the martyrs going up near the end of the tribulation, and the two witnesses completes the first resurrection. That's why John could say, Blessed and holy is he hath part in the first resurrection. Then he goes on to say, The rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. The wicked don't rise with the righteous. There's at least a thousand years between the two resurrections. 
Okay, so how many raptures are there in all? There's at least five. At least five. Four more to go. And how many more God on And the, the first one that you just explained took place when Jesus right, rose from right. the dead. Back 2,000 years ago. Uh, may, I, may I ask a question? Yes, yes uh, please do, Glenn. I don't, I, this wasn't uh, common, but I did hear uh, quite a well-known preacher say that he thought that all through the tribulation that those who truly gave their hearts to the Lord, renewed their faith, and were filled with the Spirit, would be raptured. You mean right then? Right then. Have you heard that? Uh, yes. I, some. Well, I heard as soon as they kill them, as soon as they martyr them, they jump up and run off. Now, you don't read that in the Bible. No. You read the contrary. Uh, in the, under the fifth seal of Revelation, he said, you rest a little season till your fellow servants should be killed. In other words, you're going to make this number that no man could number of all tribes, kindreds, tongues, people, and nations. So, no, that's not... That's not the teaching. They don't get glorified bodies just when they're killed or anything like that. They Brother rest Hall, till near the end. Also, another question has come up to me several times. We say that the spirit and the soul has to be united to the body, but there is no body from Adam to, to the New Testament saints. I mean, it's all decomposed, and I mean, we can't think in terms of a body. The ashes are going over to the sea and those kinds of things. How do, how do why, we understand that's that? That's why I gave you that scripture a while ago. God giveth it a body as is pleased him to every seed its own body. It'll look just like the original body, be the, be the same body, except be glorified. So we're talking about if the seed then has been planted, not necessarily looking for the same actual body. Right. Because God right. would have to bring it together from a lot of different sources. Uh, yes, but I think that body will look Right. The same, basically. Right. Jesus looked the same. He said, handle me and see a spirit hath not flesh and bone. Did you see me have? So he could eat, he could visit, they could touch him. So it is with us. When he shall appear, we shall be right. like him. Amen. Dr. Hall, last week we were discussing the rapture and the practical aspect of it of when we leave this earth. In the situation with Jesus, he is the first fruits of those that slept. He's, it, the, he's the first to rise with the glorified body. Okay. When they got to the tomb, what did they find? They found the linens in place, intact. Paul says in the fifth chapter of, first of Second Corinthians, we know that if our earthly tabernacle were dissolved, I have felt in my understanding that when the rapture takes place, the present body that we have would dissolve as his did out of the linens, out of the clothing. A new body would, would be formed or he would be given to us and we would go to heaven immediately the change would be immediate now you gave some indication last week that the change would not be instantaneous when do you mm -hmm. feel the change or, or, or am I wrong on the dissolve situation did his body dissolve and a new body came up well the word dissolve is throw down to cash down to change and has a, several different meanings but if you go back to Genesis 3 3 19 you'll find dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return but at the rapture you're just changed in a moment to an eye. You don't go through the process of death. You don't go Jesus through Jesus died, so that's the right. Right, right. The dissolve is very quick. <laughs> yes. Very quick. It's it has to be very quick. It is a change then from the physical substance to a to a glorified. Right. See, this quality. corruptible shall put on incorruption, that's speaking of the dead, and this mortal shall put on immortality. See, there's the change right there. There's where there's where the old tabernacle shall be dissolved, and we look for a new tabernacle. But uh, really, the dissolved there is going back to dust, going out. But you won't go through that if you're living now when right. Jesus comes. That's, what, that's the point we wanted to bring out and make clear. Mm -hmm. The moment the trump of God sounds, the person that's alive in Christ will not suddenly crumble to dust and all of a sudden no, right. take on a new body. Right. That's not, it, the, the word change means simply that this flesh will put on uh, incorruption. Be right? glorified, right. Right, and put the, on immortality. What was the verse Paul gave, uh, Romans 8, to, is it 14? Mm -hmm. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in your mortal bodies, the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken Quick. your mortal body. But Christ's body didn't really have any time to go back to any dust. No, sir. But what my point was that when they got there, the linens were all mm -hmm. intact. His body left that area without unwrapping the linens, without anything, and he had a new body. That was the dissolved right. part that I was right. I was trying to apply to, to Second Corinthians chapter five, but he didn't go through that whole process. Okay, right. Okay. So an important issue is here that uh, the important issue for us then is that we have the Spirit of God. It, this is not an outward work. This it, this is the work that's done inwardly. That changing comes as a result of having His Spirit. Well, if you don't have the Spirit, you're not going anywhere. Not going anyway. to change. You're not going to change. So it takes the Spirit yeah. of God in us. But, Brother right, Swagger, what he's mentioned to me has been, uh, last week, was so impressive to me, and I'd never understood it this way. 
He is teaching that that the, the unbelievers will be able to watch us as we leave this earth. Well, I, I heard a little bit of that, and uh, um, I, I, uh, that's been in my mind, too, for this particular reason. A lot of things are taught that I'm not so certain that are exactly kosher <laughs> or biblical or correct. For instance, this is a little off the subject, but still on it in a sense. It's, it's been taught that whenever the child of God leaves, I heard it ever since I've been a kid, they'll never even miss us. Mm -hmm. They're going to miss us oh. something terrible. Don't you yeah. think? Yeah. I believe they will. Yeah. I believe yeah. they will. <laughs> they're going to miss because the church is the great restraining <clears throat> right. force. Right. And they're going to miss us something terribly so. But when, it, when, it, when that change takes place, that, that really doesn't mean a disappearance, does it? shall be changed right. in a moment in the twinkling right. of an eye. And what you're saying, that the possibility exists that those that are here, and it'll be daytime in some parts of the right. world, right. will actually see their loved ones leave. They could easily do it because they saw the others. Uh, Elijah, they saw him when he left the earth. Right. They noticed Jesus as he left. And sinners have mm -hmm. eyes. They can see the same as saints can. And I think that'd be the greatest awakening that has ever hit wow. this earth. All at once, see people rising and going up. If you wanted to get the attention of the world, if, if you wanted to right. really get the attention of the whole wide world, the rapture will get the attention of this planet as nothing else yes. ever has. That's the greatest thrilling thing you can think of, is think of everybody going up from the, all around this world. Every child of God. Yeah, all yeah. at once. Babies will leave the crib. Okay, what is the purpose of the rapture? Why does really God, I know he wants to get the attention of the world, but there are other reasons. Can you give us that? Well, to take us out of the world before the wrath of God is poured out upon it. Oh, but you're going to get an argument there, John. A lot of people says that the wrath is really made to purify us. Yes, given. yes. Well, we wonder sometimes why, if they're going to argue that, why did John, that wrote the book of Revelation, why did he die a natural death, went on back over there and pastored a church, and all of that after the Isle of Patmos, and the others were crucified, others were killed different ways, and old John got out of that and died a natural death. Well, the argument is we must all go through this deal. I don't know what all they call it, but it's a bunch of nonsense. Protestant purgatory is what they call it. Call it what? Protestant, Protestant purgatory. purgatory. Yeah, well, they can have that purgatory, and, <laughs> and uh, I have no time for that. It's not in the Bible. It's not taught. If you're saved, you're going. Yeah, that's right. all there is to it. You don't have right. to go through these processes of, of all that stuff. People live godly in Christ Jesus. They'll suffer persecution. Some places in the world, they're suffering more than they are. We're blessed in America because we have protection. Right, under the Thank Constitution. Thank God for it. Yeah, right. Okay, so the, the purpose is to receive the saints to himself. Right, before the tribulation. And really, uh, Brother Swagger, as you well know, the tribulation is primarily for Israel. It's to turn Israel back to God. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the church's trouble. I, I think that uh, this, is, this is a little bit off the subject, but I want to take advantage of this man's knowledge every minute that we're here. And, and even though this is, this is last set, as I've said, I'm stammering a little bit today. I'm tired, to be frank with you. Um, I want to discuss Israel tomorrow. A lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about Israel, and uh, it sort of fits in with what we're talking about here, and I think it would be immensely interesting to you. Number one, will Israel be destroyed? There's a lot of thought, teaching, respecting the destruction of Israel. Number two, will the Soviet Union invade Israel at any day now or the next couple of years or whatever the case may be? Number three, Ezekiel 38, does that refer to, Israel, uh, to the Soviet Union invading Israel um, as it's taught in many, many circles? And I've read many sermons like this when uh, Russia's bones bleach on Israel's sands and all kind of sermons like this. Um, what is going to happen to the state of Israel? Israel is having problems right now with inflation, always had problems with surrounded by enemies. Um, what, what is going to happen to this little tiny state? I think we'd like to discuss this, and even though it's not really planned, this is just right off the spur of the moment, I believe it would be immensely interesting. So tell your friends and neighbors about it. I think there are a few people in the world that know more about this than Dr. John G. Hall does. From the Bible, not somebody's brain, but from the Word of God. We're going to study something that I had not really previously planned on studying. It's a slight deviation from what we set out to study, but it, yet it sort of joins in with it as well. 
We're going to be studying Israel. I know a few men in this world that know more about this particular subject, biblically speaking, than uh, Dr. John G. Hall. Um, I want to talk to, with Dr. Hall and the panel here about Israel. What, what Israel's future is, what's going to happen to her. Will Russia invade the nation of Israel? What does Ezekiel 38 mean? Now, uh, all of the brethren here are, in my opinion, very knowledgeable concerning the state of Israel, the Jewish people, God's plan for Israel, but I, I do consider Dr. Hall to be an authority on this particular subject. Uh, John, I think it would be proper if we went back to the very beginning to try to help our audience understand exactly how Israel plays such a prominent part in the plan of God and how they were imported in the past and uh, how they are imported now. Could you go back to Abraham? Well, we might say concerning Abraham. You know, up until the time Abraham, God dealt with people in general. Now, Abraham was called out, and he wished to work through Abraham and his seed to be the leading evangelistic nation. I think we read in uh, Genesis fourteen thirteen, Abraham the Hebrew. Of course, he gets that name from coming on the other side of the river. Actually, he was a father of the Gentiles before he was actually a father of the Jews. But uh, anyway, the Jews consider Abraham as their father, and Jesus acknowledged that, that uh, that he was their father. But anyway, they was to be the leading evangelistic nation. What do you mean a leading evangelistic well, nation? Well, they was to be the, the evangelize the world, so to speak. And at the time of Paul, they were broken off in unbelief, and God ceased to deal with Israel as a nation. And then the gospel was carried to the Gentiles. Today, the Gentiles are evangelizing the Jews. But a little later in, in the millennial reign, the Jews again will pick up the gospel and will carry the gospel message. And so going back to Abraham, Genesis 12, also Genesis 15 and several places there, God promised Abraham and his seed some 250,000 square miles, the entire land of Canaan. What, what, what would now, that consist of in today's well, boundaries? <clears throat> well, we, we, we don't have, we don't have, we don't have a map back. here to look at, and so we just... Uh, uh, I think it would be the quicker way just to tell you it takes in the entire land of Canaan. And man has tried to refute this grant of land, but God will ultimately fulfill his promise and give them the, all the land that he promised to Abraham and to his seed. Well, doesn't it go to the and, River Euphrates? Oh, yeah, always to the River Euphrates. Oh, and, yeah. And then the Mediterranean on the west. Right. And uh, then down uh, on the, in the south where? It says the river of Egypt. Now, what is the river of Egypt? Is it the Suez Canal or a little wadi that's running through? Well, there? I don't think it's that little wadi you were talking about there, but uh, I think it goes on down, takes in all that area. Really. All, the, yeah. all the Sinai. Yeah, yeah all the Sinai area. So uh, the, all that land was promised to Abraham and to his seed. Now, coming on down there, you're speaking of the Jews being the leading evangelistic nation. Here they're broken off in unbelief at the time of Paul. Now... They will be saved as a nation. They're in blindness today. They, they, they're blind to the coming of the Messiah. They reject Christ, as you well know. They believe in God and believe in all of that. But they don't believe in the Messiah. That is, like we do, like the first coming of Christ into this world as a babe in Bethlehem. So at the end of the tribulation period, Paul writes in Romans 11, 25, and 26, All Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and will turn away the ungodness from Jacob. Now, Israel as a nation will receive their Messiah at his second coming back to the earth. I often put it this way. Israel's looking for their Messiah at the end of the tribulation. We're looking for Jesus to come before the tribulation of churches. So they don't believe he's come. So taking up this uh, little country Israel here, uh, as I said, they're in blindness. There they'll receive the gospel. They'll become the leading evangelistic nation. And you mentioned something else there about the destruction of Israel. Really, there's no such thing as annihilating Israel. There's no such thing as that. In other words, you're saying that the Soviet Union will not annihilate or will not attack or invade Israel? Now, to attack and invade is different, but nowhere does it teach that Russia will invade Israel. The only time Russia will ever invade Israel is at the Battle of Armageddon, 
And by that time, she has been defeated anyway and one of the allies of the Antichrist. Now, now well, let me interrupt you a second. Now, you've just got through saying that the Soviet Union is in for a defeat not too many years from now. That's right. That's right. If Jesus would come today, Russia, communism, I'll put it this way. It might sound a little more pleasant, but communism be fed to the fowls of the air at the end of the tribulation. That could be seven years from today. God's going words, to be sanctified in the eyes of the heathen. Okay, but uh, we're not talking about the Battle of Armageddon now respecting the defeat of Russia. Russia will have been defeated before the Battle of Armageddon. Oh, yes, Russia is set actually for four more defeats. Her first defeat will be losing power over many of the old Roman Empire countries. Like Yugoslavia and so Yeah, forth. Albania, Rome, Bulgaria, and Romania, and those countries. She holds sway over today. Those are Roman Empire countries, and they will revert back and be on the leadership of the Antichrist. Okay, now where do you get that in Scripture? Well, I get it from the 8th chapter and the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, where the Antichrist will reign over those ten countries. It's made up of the old Roman Empire. Well, excuse me for a moment now. And I, I don't I hope I don't infuriate our audience by continuing to interrupt you here, but but um, many would say and do say that uh, it will still be Russia because the Antichrist will be Russian. No, the Antichrist will not be Russian. Daniel eleven thirty six and thirty seven teaches he will be a Syrian Jew. He will not honor the God of his fathers nor his father's fathers. He will honor God whom his fathers knew not. He's not going to honor the God of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Jesus said in John 5:43, I've come in my father's name. Me he will not receive. If another shall come in his own name, him he will receive. And Daniel 9:27 says they will receive him and will form a seven-year covenant with him. If he were not a Jew... Israel would never receive him to begin with. So he's got to be a Syrian Jew. Yes, will... and Russia, as you well know, Russia was never a part of the old Roman Empire that consists of some 24 states. But some of its satellite countries are. Yes, right. Yugoslavia, Albania, oh, yes. Czechoslovakia, etc., etc. Right. And so you're saying then that the Antichrist, to get control of those countries, which the Bible teaches he will do, uh, Russia will have to suffer some type of defeat before they will voluntarily give up those countries. That's right. That's her first defeat. Her second defeat will be in Daniel 11:44, where tidings out of the east and now the north will trouble the Antichrist. There's where he leaves Jerusalem and goes north and actually conquers Russia, becomes the prince of Meshach and Tubal, then leads Russia into the valley of Megiddo and makes his invasion into Jerusalem, and there's where communism will be defeated by that's, the second coming of Christ. That's your third defeat. Yeah. Okay, where's your fourth one? Well, I did I say four or three? <clears throat> Whatever. If it's three, I said three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's four, you meant three. Yeah, huh? if it's four, I meant three. <laughs> what countries apparently will align with the Antichrist? Well, you have, uh, you have 24 states made up of uh, the old Roman Empire. 24 states. takes in all the old Roman Empire. Now, we know of four of those countries when it's reduced to ten. What the other six are, we don't know. We know Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. That's the four countries that we know of that will be in line with the Antichrist. So now, going back to this other thought, Brother Swagger, the, the um, Russia going to annihilate Israel. You hear a lot of this today. I remember years ago when Russia was uh, real strong in Egypt. She had 20,000 soldiers, 10,000 trainees. Preachers preached that Russia was going up and annihilate Israel. Now we heard about Afghanistan. She's going to go up and annihilate Israel. First thing is no such thing as destroying Israel. Israel just as indestructible as the church is. There's going to be an Israel here during the tribulation, going to be an Israel in the millennium. That's God's people, and they're going to be here right on. And, and uh, no such thing. Now, Russia may well attack Israel, but that's not given in the Bible anywhere. It's not given. They try to make two battles out of Ezekiel 38 and the 39th chapter. Okay, I want you to explain Ezekiel 38 and 39. Yeah, they get Russia coming up here and attacking Israel before there's before the Battle of Armageddon ever starts. That's only one battle that will take place, Ezekiel 38th chapter, and that's the time it's, she, she has been defeated by the Antichrist and led by the Antichrist, coming down to take the land to divide the spoils among them. Okay, it says in the first three verses of chapter 38, Ezekiel, uh, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, etc., etc., and many say that this is speaking of Russia. Well, they, what they miss here, Gog is really one of the names of the Antichrist. That's one of his names. That's what they haven't discovered, I guess. G-O-G, -G, Gog. Yeah, Gog goes north and 
conquers Russia, becomes the prince of Meshach and Tubal, then leads Russia into the Valley of Megiddo, and then makes his invasion into Jerusalem. But this is at the, near the end of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, and really, Russia has nothing to do with the first invading of of Israel here. The Antichrist moves himself into Israel here, sets himself in the temple in the middle of the tribulation, and Russia has nothing to do that. Do with that? Russia has not been conquered as yet by the Antichrist. Okay, the two words Meshach and Tubal. I read some time ago that one preacher said Meshach meant Moscow and Tubal meant Tobolsk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we associate the, a lot of this chapter with Russia due to the 11th chapter of Daniel in verse 44 where he will go north and will conquer Russia. And, of course, Russia is north. The old idea is coming from Russia. Russia was never part of the old Roman Empire, and there's no countries north of Russia for him to conquer anyway. So, so I was just trying to refute that little idea there. But the 11th chapter, you get it, where this is Russia, where he will go north and conquer Russia. And Daniel, Daniel 11, Daniel 11 44. Brother Hall, why do you say that Israel is indestructible? There's uh, people out there that's going to disagree with that. Well, because uh, God's made covenants and promises with Abraham and to his seed. And if you notice there, all Israel will be saved at the end of the tribulation. In the millennium, right there where God promised Abraham all that land in Genesis, that would be divided among the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And if there was no Israel, there would be no way to divide anything. But won't Israel be defeated one time? Uh, Israel will suffer great loss mm -hmm. at uh, near the end of the tribulation. That's her darkest hour. Battle of Armageddon. Battle of Ar she'll suffer a big loss. Two-thirds will be killed. Won't but nevertheless, she'll come, yes, come right on through. God will bring them through. And that tells us that in Zechariah, doesn't it? Yes, two-thirds. Yes, Zechariah. And two-thirds it will be killed. Now, the, now a lot of people are confused. Um, well, now, let, let's get back to Ezekiel 38. What is a C, Ezekiel 38? What, is, what battle is it typifying? Well, I'd say it's talking about the battle of Armageddon, the defeat of communism, and uh, showing Israel to be victorious over her enemies there. In the 39th chapter, the house of Israel will be seven months in burying the dead. That don't sound like she's been destroyed because she's out there burying the dead. I was, I was privileged to be in uh, Israel when they was having Adolf Eichmann's trial. And he said he could go to the grave rejoicing with six million Jews on his hands. But I want to tell you something. He went anyway but rejoicing. They got rid of that enemy and sprinkled his ashes over the sea, and Israel marches on. See, the Antichrist is going to try and do something nobody's ever succeeded. You have the uh, you have the Hitlers, you have all of those who try to destroy the Jews to do away with them, and the Antichrist is going to try the same thing. But he'll meet his defeat at the Battle of Armageddon, and God will step out and fight for his people, Israel. Anyone have any questions let on me, Armageddon? Let me move on the Battle of Armageddon for just a minute, since he's mentioned it so much. You are being accused, and other e leading evangelicals, of leading the president down the road hastening the battle of Armageddon, believing this arms race is to hasten the battle of Armageddon. I think we need to clarify here today that this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Well, I, I heard that. That's, that's got to be one of the most foolish statements in the whole wide world. But you're being accused, sir. Uh, just because we believe in a strong America. Yes. And that, that is hastening the battle of Armageddon. Uh, nothing is going to hasten the battle of Armageddon. It, it is right. an appointed, That's it? Right. doesn't it say, John? Yes, God's time's all set. Before and Ronald Reagan is not going to have anything to do with the battle of Armageddon. Nothing. While we're talking about that, in the battle of Armageddon, when it's fought, uh, it'll be, it, it won't really be primarily a battle between nations as such, will it? That's right. In the 19th chapter of Revelation, the Antichrist and his armies is there to fight against Christ to try to hinder him from setting up his kingdom. Okay, I, I want to ask a question now. This is the question that a lot of our viewers will ask. Now, how can the Antichrist think that um, he can fight Christ whom he cannot see? How can he fight God whom he cannot see? How can you mobilize an army to fight something you can't find or see? Well, you keep in mind that the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the devil will be right here in person. The devil knoweth he hath but a short time. So they're coming down to take the little country Israel, to take the land, to divide the spoils among them. And the same time, the Scripture says they're there to fight against him who set up on the white horse. They're trying to defeat Christ. So Satan knows a little about that Bible. He can quote those Scriptures. He knows what's going to be. And... Uh, He's aware of those things, so he, uh, Satan would be right there in person uh, along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. So 
And the weapons, uh, Pastor, that they're using, they won't be the weapons that uh, we're thinking of anyway. With the brightness of his coming, he's going to slay the wicked there. So all this arms race today has nothing to do with the Battle of Armageddon. I'm glad you brought that out. I'm so good, to the good script, point. Excuse me, the scripture said, every eye shall see him. Yes, that's the second coming. Every eye shall see him, and they that have pierced him so shall look across will be able to see him too. Oh, yes, they yeah. can see him. Oh, yes. Brother Hall, what do we do with those people who say that all of the scriptures that refer to Israel really are spiritualized to the church? Good, good question. Well, what you do with those people, I don't know. The Bible said something about he that's ignorant, let him be ignorant still. I guess that's about all you can do with some of them because uh, they're going to insist that uh, that don't mean Israel, that means us. Now, you have three classes of people dealt with in your Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, I believe it's 28th verse. Paul said, give no offense neither to the Jew nor the Gentile nor to the church. But it reads the church of God there. It means the body of Christ. As some of you become a little exalted out there on your church of God. In the Greek, it reads unto the assemblies of God. I just thought I'd mention that to you. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> there's a hundred and some names you can call your church still be in Bible order. So don't think for a moment we, we feel like we're the only ones going to make it. But uh, the, uh, there's your three classes of people that your Bible deals with. Jew, Gentile, and the church. In reading those scriptures... Read before the verse, after the verse, see which group he's talking about. And leave it literal. Leave it like it's talking. And don't try to spiritualize, change, and do away with the literal truth that's conveyed by that Bible. A lot of people say, oh, Revelation's got a lot of this. Revelation has a few symbolical statements in there. But get the literal truth conveyed by the symbol and then forget about the symbol. There's literal truth taught by those things. Okay, let's let's look at let's look at Matthew twenty four for a moment. Now a lot of Christians get this mixed up with the rapture. Matthew twenty four, they think it's talking about the <clears throat> the rapture. The, they think it's talking about the second coming of the Lord, or and uh, some of the thinking is correct, some is incorrect. And what is Matthew twenty four and uh, what is it Luke twenty one and uh, so forth and so on? What what does it mean, John? It's talking about the second coming of Christ back to the earth. It really has no reference to the rapture at all. Uh, Paul was first to bring the doctrine of the rapture to the church, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. This is talking of his second coming back to this planet earth. If you notice uh, there, this is given there at the time when they're asking him about the destruction of Jerusalem, what will be the signs of your coming. And verse 29 tells you what coming he's talking about. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give light. So it's speaking of his second coming back to the earth because they knew nothing of the rapture at this time. Or right, what is, what was Jesus talking about in, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15 when he said? The 15th verse says, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken with Daniel the prophet, who so read, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee in the mountains, you're on the house stop, don't come down, take anything in the house, you're in the field, don't return back for your clothes, and woe be unto them a child, them to give suck in those days, pray that your flight to be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world, and at that time there ever shall be. Uh, which verse did you say? <laughs> 15th verse. Oh, 15th the verse. abomination. Oh, when you see this abomination of desolation, when you see this Antichrist setting himself in the temple, now uh, you go back to Daniel 12, and that's where Daniel spoke of that. Uh, when you see this happening, then the covenant is broken. You get out of here. You flee. He's telling the Jews to leave, the leave Jews Jerusalem. To leave Jerusalem. Come go where? <clears throat> yeah, well, go into the old city of Petra. Many of them will. Come, my people. Hide yourself, as it were, for a moment. Tell the indignation of tribulation be past. And m much of them will flee into the old city of Peter. So when you see this, you get out of there. Flee. Okay, that's going to happen, though, in the middle. In the middle. That's right in the, the middle of the tribulation. Of the great tribulation yeah. period and pertains only to Israel. That's right. That's to Israel. But you see, a lot of people have not understood what, what, what it means by the words abomination of desolation as spoken by Daniel the prophet. You said he outlined it in chapter 12. Well, he spoke about it in chapter 12. Now, the abomination that uh, we are familiar with, the one that happened before, Antiochus Epiphanes, the last Syrian king, he polluted the temple with a swine and caused the abomination to make a death. Now, where the Antichrist will do that or not, we don't know, but it's something evidently similar and could be the same thing. That he'll do. And then the Jews will resent that pig. They'll resent that right off the bat. And well, the covenant is broken. Okay, now you're saying then, and the Bible tells us, that the temple's going to be rebuilt. 
Oh, yes, the temple on the old Mount Moriah, the temple will be built. Daniel eleven forty five. he shall plant the tabernacle on the glorious holy mount, which is Mount Moriah. There'll be a temple built there. And we understand plans are up to come up with that temple in due time. And by the middle of the tribulations where the Antichrist will set himself in that temple. Now, I might mention this. There are people out there today teaching that Jesus can't come until this temple is built. Why now, do they teach that? Uh, well, because they think it, because the Antichrist is going to set himself in the temple and the daily sacrifice is going to be restored, but all that has to be before the rapture. That don't have to be before the rapture. They'd have three and a half years to build that temple after the rapture before the Antichrist occupies that temple. You can build a pretty good building in three. Oh, yeah, yeah three whole... years. I've been working seven on my house. <laughs> <laughs> the Mount Moriah is the third most holy place in all the Muslim religion. Mecca, Medina, and then Mount Moriah are the Dome of the Rock. Now, how are they going to how are they going to build a temple there when there's a shrine there? Today? Well, there's the Dome of the Rock. The Mosque of Omar stands there. They a beautiful temple. A privilege to be in that temple. A lot of look like a lot of gold up there. But one Jew, one man said he said uh, there could be an act of God that move that temple. I don't know what all he meant by that. But if that's in the spot where the temples be built, that will be moved. If it's not in the spot, it'll be built over from it. So the exact little spot over there, I can't know. Somebody went over at the tape there a while back and did some measuring and then told us where it's going to be. And that's a bunch of nonsense. Forget that. So, uh, so it will be built on old Mount Moriah in the last days. And there's where the Antichrist will occupy the temple. And there's where the abomination will be is in that temple. Now, you did read in Time and Newsweek, they talked about this group of young Jewish people in Jerusalem that's now studying to serve in the coming temple that will be rebuilt. They're actually studying there mm -hmm. now as outlined by Time and Newsweek. Did you, did you read that's that? That's all interesting, and it blesses you to think of all that, uh, Brother Swigert. It blesses your soul because if we can see people looking down especially in the tribulation, preparing for things, it ought to tell us one thing. Right. It's right. time for us to get out of That's here. That's the point. Yes. That's the Jesus point. Jesus is coming yes. for his church. All righty. Uh, the millennial reign, the most glorious time yes. the world has ever known. A lot of you know what that is. A lot of you do not know what it is. And uh, the word itself really is not in the Bible. And that, isn't that correct, John? The word millennium. That's right. And, yes. but, so we're going to discuss what it really is. And it's one of the most glorious studies. There's no study to me that's any more beautiful and wonderful than the millennium. And, uh, once again, Dr. Hall is, is an authority on this subject. And I think it will be a blessing to you. All right. The millennial reign is one of the most beautiful teachings in the entirety of the Word of God. I'm going to read a little scripture. John quotes it. I have to read it. Isaiah chapter 11, starting with the first word of the first verse, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with, with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And notice this, this is beautiful. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the Glory. kid, and the calf and the young lion. You want to finish it, John? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing mighty good there. <laughs> okay. The calf and the young lion um, shall, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put, put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest Glory. shall be glorious. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Give me just a moment to worship, just a moment, because I'm looking Praise forward Hallelujah. to that moment when Praise His rest shall be glorious. Hallelujah. We'll lay down our sword and shield down by the riverside, and we'll study war no more. There'll be no more 
dying and death and sorrow and sickness and heartache and Satan will be locked away. That's the millennial reign. John, many people teach the millennial reign in, in quite a number of different ways. Um, will not Jesus himself come back and personally reign in Jerusalem during this thousand year reign? Uh, Ezekiel 43, 7 said, Jerusalem is the place of my throne henceforth and forever. Now, Isaiah, the second chapter teaches he also he will reign there. And that's where all laws, religions will be issued from the headquarters office in Jerusalem. In fact, the late David Ben-Gurion said uh, Jerusalem will soon become the world capital headquarters. Now, Isaiah, the second chapter said the word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house to be stabbed on top of the mountain, be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow in thereat. And many people go and say, Come and let us go up to the mount of the house of the God of Jacob. He will worship, we will, we will worship him. And it goes on to tell you there about the sword and all of that will disappear. And the word of the Lord shall go forth from Jerusalem, the law from Zion. So it shows you that will become the world capital headquarters in Jerusalem. And that's where Jesus is going to reign. In right other words, there. he is personally coming back. This will start at the second coming when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olivet. Right. Zechariah 14, 4 and 5. In that day, his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. goes on to tell you, half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. And there shall be a very great valley. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. Now, the mountain splitting in two. That, and telling you about the big valley, there's where the blood will flow to the depths of the horse's bridles through that created valley. And that, during the Battle of Armageddon. During the Battle of Armageddon. And Ezekiel shows God will rain great hailstones and a great flood. Mixing that with the blood will cause it to flow red like a river, which makes it simple and easy to be understood. So Jesus will reign in Jerusalem, and that's at the end of the tribulation when he comes back to this earth. Now, the... That chapter you was reading there, some of it, the first part there, speaking of the coming of Christ as a babe, and then it goes on to tell about his reign, how he's going to take over the kingdoms of the world. And you read some scriptures there, beautiful scriptures there, where the great change has taken place in the animal kingdom. They won't devour each other, it says there. And a weaned child, suckling child, put forth her hand on a cockatrice then, and it won't hurt them, it won't bite them or, dis or harm the child. And a little child will lead those animals. And uh, that's going to be something different. This is during the millennial reign. During in other the words, the, the nature of the animal kingdom is going to be changed. Right. The, the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. Now, you know what happens if they get together today? One ceases to be. But there, they'll lie down together and they won't devour and they'll return back eating grass and other things and, uh, and won't be devouring each other. Wasn't that the way they were created yes. before Adam's fall? Right, right. That's so the, the plan of God will come full swing and full circle and be realized. Right. When old Adam walked out there and named all those animals, never went to school a day in his life. Had to be a smart one. <laughs> yes, he was smart. And we go to the zoo today with the little knowledge we have, and we looked at names and can't pronounce them. That old boy never went to school a day in his life <laughs> and walked out there and named all those animals, drawing on the resources of God, and that's when the animals were good. Now, when Adam fell, that's the everything was cursed, the earth cursed, everything in it was cursed. But that curse will be lifted. A curse will be lifted. Long life restored to natural peoples. The thorns and the thistles will disappear off the earth. The animal kingdom will change. And a little child will be able to lead the animals and it won't hurt nor destroy. Okay, now, we teach that the millennial reign, and, and, and explain the word millennium before I get to the question. Well, the word millennium, uh, it's uh, milli meaning thousand, anna meaning year, years. <laughs> it's the Greek, it's the... It's the Greek word there. So the word doesn't appear in the Bible, but the meaning of it does. The thousand years. And that's given in Revelation 20 chapter mentioned about four or five times there, the thousand years. And that's really what it means. We use the word millennium to make it simple, easy to be understood. Or the thousand year reign with Christ. Yeah, a thousand years reign of Christ. Same way with the word rapture. Paul uses being caught up to meet the Lord or our get together. So we, we use the word rapture to make it easy for us. I see. Brother Swagger, let me ask you a question. Will Jesus set up a throne in Jerusalem during this millennium, or will he rule from the temple? Where will he rule from? 
Well, good, good uh, he'll rule from Jerusalem there, and there will be a temple built one mile square, and he'll, he'll be there reigning in the temple, and they'll go from year to year to worship the Lord. Zechariah 14 teaches that if Egypt fails to go to Jerusalem and worship the Lord, this will be the plague wherewith he'll smite them. Everybody will have to go to church and do the things that's right in the millennium, and they'll have to send uh, TV offerings and tithes and radio <laughs> No, I slipped that in there. <laughs> but anyway, they'll give their offerings. They'll come up and worship before the Lord there. And Christ will literally be right there in Jerusalem. So Ezekiel 43, 7, Jerusalem is the place of my throne henceforth and forever. He's going to reign right So there. he will have a literal throne there. Yeah, and he'll have a temple. And you can see, sure see the potential. In that's our, Ezekiel's temple yeah, in 47. That's Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47. That, you're right, right on target there. That's, and that's not the temple that the Antichrist right, is going to occupy. Right. He'll have nothing to do with that temple. This is the temple the Lord will build when he comes to this planet Earth. Well, Ezekiel even measured it, didn't he? Right, he measured it. Oh, yes. Give us some measurements and everything. Now, yeah. now let me ask this. Excuse me, Glenn. Oh, go ahead. Please no, forgive me for interrupting you. But will not the daily sacrifices be reinstituted in the millennial reign in the temple? Yes, there are certain things, uh, Brother Swag, will be given in the millennium because uh, the lessons and all and a few of those things. Now, we still observe the Lord's Supper. Though Jesus came, died, crucified, and gone back to heaven, we we observe different things today as a memorial, showing his death till he comes again. And in the millennium, there will be certain things people be doing, uh, natural peoples on the earth, not the glorified. The natural people will be doing certain things. They're carrying out those sacrifices. I want to talk about that natural people in a moment. But now this will be a literal kingdom, won't it? This is literal. Oh, yes, literal kingdom. Now, what do we mean by the word literal? Well, it's, it's not some spiritual. I was in a debate years ago in Los Angeles with a gentleman and, and he said that we're going to reign from heaven. We're going to, and I don't want to say too much because they'll realize who, who they were, but a lot of good people in those uh, doctrines. They just get misled and deceived. But he said, we're going to reign from heaven. So I challenged him. I said, sir, would you present the audience with one verse of scripture where you're going to reign from heaven? I knew he couldn't give it, knew it wasn't in there. Well, he him hauled around, had a bunch of books there, and couldn't do it. And and uh, I didn't have anything to go on. I couldn't read, <laughs> so, so to speak. And uh, so I said, "Now, folks, you've heard of what he said. He has no no scripture whatsoever to back his doctrine here. And Revelation five and ten, God's made us kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. Now your Bible right. says we're going to reign on the earth. He says you're going to reign from heaven. Which one are you going to believe? You're going to believe the Bible. You're going to believe what what he's saying. Well, in those debates, believe it or not, we got a lot of people come over to the full gospel church. I really appreciate what you've emphasized. I heard it in the early days, and a lot of those boys got away from it. I remember in the early days when they prayed for the sick and the people got blessed and got healed. They would say to those people, you go to a church that preaches this doctrine. Yeah. Like, right. like you received here. Right. Don't go back to those dead churches. Right. Now right. today they've changed. I know. And it's but wrong. I notice John. you, I notice you haven't. No. That's one of the things I like about you. Well, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, uh, you don't want to stay where the full gospel is not preached. You lose what you, they say, oh, we're going to stay here and convert them all. Well, uh, that usually is not the way. Works the other way around yes, most sir. of the time. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> I don't so remember it, what we was talking about. Literal, there, literal. Was, yeah, literal. Yeah. This thing is literal. It's going to be a real, literal kingdom, literal people, literal subjects, everything. It's going to be wonderful. Manufacturing? Well, it could be. Oh, yes. Life goes on. They'll plant their vineyards, build their houses. And uh, every man said in his own fig tree, his own vineyard. Life goes on. My mind goes a million miles a minute right now when I yes. think of in this last few years, technology, science, flights, airplanes, TV, telephones, all these that now are so much being used for corruption in so many areas. But that's going to be used. Flights to Jerusalem from any part of the world. In a matter, what did I hear? In the year 2000, they'd be able to catch a, a, take a rocket from any one airport in the world and land on any other airport in the world in 45 minutes. Now I can go. Do you I, think that's what's going to happen? I can go 45 minutes faster than that. Oh, can you? Yes, sir. Because I'll have a glorified body. I'll say absent, present. 
<laughs> yeah, but what about? The, uh, yeah, I know so you're talking. We, we, we want to discuss that right now. I know now, you're talking about the next before y'all get nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now, what well, type? That's of, interesting. What that type of people? Yes. What type of people will be on the earth? Just Good be natural, natural people. It's good people going and, out there. And and you you gave something there. At uh, I wanted to insert this when you said all this stuff is being used for the devil today, so to speak. They'll beat their swords and the plowshares, right. spears right. and the pruning hook. It'll be converted back to the good things. And thank right. God for right. it. Well, they need to be converted. Well, yes. Well, some things will be. No, in terms of the people. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The people. So they'll need to be born of the Spirit? Well, that's the only way. Yes, sir. Will there be some who are not? Okay. He, he, uh, he, let, before we get into that, I want, I want to get the two types of people because a lot of people watching this have not uh, separated day. yet what type of people we're talking about. Now, isn't it correct, biblically speaking, that there will be two types of people, the natural people and the glorified saints on the earth? Right. See, the, those going in the rapture will get the glorified bodies. Those remaining on the earth through the tribulation will be separated as sheep nations at the end of the tribulation. And those sheep nations, along with Israel, they go out into the millennium, and then the glorified saints will reign over those living natural people. In other words, those that are still alive at the end of the Battle of Armageddon will come right on over into the millennium. Right. And as long as they keep the laws right. and obey the Lord, they they'll live, live. They can live forever. Am I... Am I, am I uh, don't don't forget your train of thought. No, I want to go back no, to what you were saying. Am I... And correct in saying that half the population of the world will move to the tribulation into the millennium? Is that probably more than that? Probably more than that. Wait, I, wait a minute now. Half of the tribulation. Well, population of the a world. population right now of almost five billion. Supposing the Jesus came and the tribulation began, you go through the tribulation, not all the people are destroyed. From what I could estimate that about half of the population maybe died during the tribulation. That'll mean Two and a half billion to three billion. Well, let's you? put it this way. Kingdoms and countries and nations continue to exist, and only those who have taken the mark, name, and number will not be privileged to enter the millennium after the Battle of Armageddon. So it's going to be a lot of people. Oh, yeah, a lot of people. Oh, they, oh, countries yeah. go right I, on. Well, that, that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. And in effect, so mm -hmm. see, a lot of our people, John, that watches, they get a little confused. On the natural and the spiritual. The natural and the spiritual. Now, the spiritual, the glorified saints will include Abraham, Isaac, right. Jacob, All the Old David, Testament. New Testament, and everyone that's ever lived for God since the beginning of time, correct? Right, right. All right. And, and those, we, whomever that's born again, will have glorified bodies. Right. And that's what you were talking about when you're talking about instant transportation. Right. That's us. That's ones going in the rapture. But that does not include the natural people. No, see, Jesus, he could make his appearance. He could appear in the room with the doors being closed. Bar yeah, but we're concerned about those that, that aren't, don't have glorified gut bodies. Don't you think they will use oh, yes, the modern now, technology? Yeah, to, they will. Yes. They but now will. that's the reason, that, talking about the glorified bodies, that, isn't that the reason the word says, blessed are they who have part in the first resurrection? Yes, I'll take the first resurrection. Because we I'll will have that, per, that prerogative and that glory right. and that wonder that coming generations will not have. Right, right. I want him to explain what a glorified body is. Well, a glorified body, you're just uh, changed, glorified. Uh, Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones, so you'll have flesh and bone. You'll be able to eat in a glorified body. All those things you'll be able to do in Wear a glorified body. Wear clothes, you'll look like you do now. Or? Oh, yes, look like we look now, except the defects will disappear. If you've lost the and remember your body, you'll have a complete new body. Well, I'd be black-headed or white-headed, no wonder. Which way you want to be? <laughs> <laughs> he says he'd be satisfied with any kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll take what you don't want. <laughs> what, now, what point did you bring out? And I, I went back a little further. No, it's fine. I was just asking, if we're talking about natural bodies and natural people, then is salvation the same then as it is now? Good point. And if it is... Then why the sacrifices for natural people who don't know anything about the spiritual? Now you made a statement. There are natural bodies. What was natural that? people. We natural talk about natural people, people and spiritual that go people. over yeah. into the millennium. That go over into millennium. Yes, they'll be natural, have natural bodies. And we discussed that. But in terms of of salvation, how will they get saved? Uh, same as we get saved today. There's only one way to be saved. And that's to believe on Christ, and that's how they'll be saved in the millennium. See, there's going to be a fountain open in the house of Israel for the sin and cleansing. People will still be saved in the millennium. Be the greatest revival 
that has ever hit this earth will hit it in the millennium, led by Christ and his church and the greatest healing campaign. That's why you read, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. So that'll be the greatest that's ever been yet. We'll hit this earth, and it'll be worldwide in the millennium. So they'll hear the gospel and be saved. But there'll still be some that won't be saved. Oh, yes, entering the millennium now. I might mention uh, in getting in the millennium, salvation is not the qualification. It's being a sheep nation, being good to Israel, didn't take the mark, name, and number there when he judges those nations. They're continued to, they'd be privileged to continue to live on the earth and go out on out in the millennium. But at the end of the millennium, no one saved gets beyond the millennium. That's it. That's the last final dispensation. Well, he asked time. the question, why, if we're saved by the blood of Jesus, will we continue to offer sacrifices of lambs at the altar in Jerusalem? He really answered that. I think. Well, uh, why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Memorial. Why do we take communion? Memorial. See, we're saved and all that. So it doesn't save you. It has matter. nothing to do with, no. sal- with no, salvation. It's just memorial, just lessons it there. It won't be like it was in the Old no, Testament. No, no, it'll be no. more or less. There'll be some changes made there, I'm sure. And will those people then, the natural people who get saved, will they in turn have a glorified body? No, sir. No, no. After the rapture, after the uh, saint. Uh, Last rapture, that's it. After the first resurrection, there's no more glorified body. So let's yep. talk about Israel a little they bit. They remain natural peoples. Uh, Israel a little bit in the millennial reign. Now, not, none of the Israelites or Jews, ever, what term you want to use, that comes out of the uh, Great Tribulation period and the Battle of Armageddon and goes into the millennial reign, they will not have glorified No, bodies. sir. No, they remain uh, natural peoples. But they will be tremendous missionaries. Oh, yeah. They'll be the leading evangelistic nation in the millennium. And their seed will remain as forever. Isaiah 66, your seed will remain forever. They will remain a natural people on this earth. Israel will. All right. Uh, qu- question number two. Um, if, if the natural people, as you just got to explaining, there will be no more glorified bodies, but if they, if they, if they get saved and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they will, in effect, live forever because death has lost its sting and grave its victory. That's uh, that's one of the purposes of the millennium. Christ must reign till he put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that is destroyed is death. Now, he will destroy death in those natural people, placing those natural people back like Adam and Eve were before they ever sinned. And really, that was God's original plan, that mankind should live forever and should never die. Okay, let's talk about some that do die during the millennial reign. Not the glorified saints. They can't die. We can't die. But you've got the natural people, and some of them will die. And why will they die? Well, death will be the the why, because death has not been abolished yet. See, a lot of wonderful things in the millennium, but death has not been destroyed and won't be until at the end. Now, long life is restored in the millennium. Be considered a child at the age of 100, Isaiah 65, verse 20. And... uh, but death will not be destroyed until at the end. That's one of the purposes of the millennium. Christ must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. Then when death is abolished, that puts man back like Adam and Eve were before they ever sinned. Then they can live forever. As I said, that was God's original program. Plus now he'll have the glory fight. All right. Now, but why, why will they be executed or why will they die? Because Those they did do. not keep the laws. They did not do the things that was, they were, were right. So they were definitely dealt with. In those days, people have to do the things that's right. And they'll have to go to church and they'll have to do, do what the Lord requires them to do. And the saints will see to it that those laws are carried out. Okay, right at the end of the millennial reign, though, something's going to happen that is that is totally um, different than most of the millennial reign, all of the millennial reign, because it will be the time of the greatest peace and prosperity the world ever knew, the millennial reign. But right at the end of it, Satan is going to be loosed for a little season. Explain that. <clears throat> well, it, really, the seventh verse of Revelation 20, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed for a little season. Who shall go out and gather them together, whose number is, is of the sand of the sea? And that's the purging out of all the rebels out of the millennium. See, they've been privileged to live there because they kept the laws, kept the outward laws and things, so they wasn't dealt with. And But in their hearts, they will have that rebellion. And when they get that chance to rebel, they will rebel at the end of the millennium. And then, <clears throat> then when they do, they will be destroyed at the end of the millennial reign and no rebels left to go out into new heavens and new earth. So point number one, the millennial reign is going to be the time of the greatest peace and prosperity the world has ever known. Right. Number two, many the curse will be lifted from the earth. 
there will be plenty for everyone. The food problem will be solved. The war problem will be solved and so forth. Number three, Jesus Christ himself, having come back at the second coming, set his feet on the Mount of Olivet, will rule and reign personally in Jerusalem, which will be his headquarters. His disciples will also judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Is that correct? Right, that's right. Each disciple will be over a, a particular tribe, correct? Right. And um, there will be a river that will come out from under the temple, Part of it will flow toward the Dead Sea, part toward the Mediterranean. Right. And yes. the Dead Sea will live. And the trees that grow will be partly for the healing of the nations. Is that correct there? Uh, the, the, the I river. don't want to get over into the perfect age. Yeah, you, you almost slipped over there. Okay. But uh, what you did was all right. That was fine. Because <laughs> that, that will bless everything it touches. That river. That river, flowing yes. out. It will bless okay. everything it touches. But uh, going on over in the new heavens and new earth now. We're going to do that tomorrow. Right. We've just run out of time. <laughs> Good. Um, we're, we're going to talk about the, the infinite future. It just goes on and on and on. It's called the perfect age. This is after the millennial reign. When God's new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, and not only will Jesus have uh, set up his headquarters here, in the old Jerusalem, no doubt he'll have to rebuild some of it because of the Battle of Armageddon during the millennial reign. But in the perfect age to come, God is going to move his headquarters from heaven to earth. Right. A lot of people don't know that. But we're going to discuss that, how it's going to be, what it's going to be like. And a lot of people think that, as John was mentioning at the first part of this program, that the saints of God are going to live in heaven forever and forever and forever and forever. That is not biblically correct. That's right. And we want to, to discuss that tomorrow, and I think it will be a, a tremendous help and blessing. Would you about to say something, John? There? No. Okay. And so if you want to know what the future brings, on past the millennial reign, I mean a billion years from now, a trillion years from now, forever and forever, the Scripture tells us. What is it going to be like? Will this world be destroyed? Some thinks that it's going to be totally annihilated, blown to the proverbial smithereens until it's nothing left. Does the Bible teach that? We're going to discuss um, the earth. It's coming renovation by fire. Will it be burned up? Uh, there's talk. I say there's talk. The Bible talks about a new heavens and a new earth. We want to discuss that. And we also will discuss... Uh, the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the coming perfect age, that which will last into infinity, eternity, forever and forever. What will it be like? A lot of people talk about the end of the world. And I think it was in, I know it was in one of the Gospels where the disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? I think in the original Greek, the word should have been age, uh, the end of the age. But people talk about the end of the world. They talk about how it will end. And the scripture mentions some things about this earth burning. And we want to discuss that, as I've mentioned, and we want to, dis to discuss what is going to happen thereafter. Uh, John, will this earth ever end? And what was Peter talking about when he spoke of uh, the heavens, uh, the wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and so forth and Second so on. 2 Peter 3.10 there, wherein the heavens being on fire, and the earth shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Of uh, Hence we look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, if you notice, righteousness is the key thought there. Everything of a sinful nature will be abolished, will be renovated, will be done away with. There's no such thing as God's going to throw this earth away and take time off to make a brand new one. Uh, it'll be changed. Paul says, as a vesture, thou shalt fold it up, and it shall be changed. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, teaches there, the word signifieth once more, not only the earth will be shaken, but the heavens will be shaken. Those things which cannot be shaken will remain. But here's a verse in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 3 and 4. One generation cometh, one passeth away, but the earth abideth for." Ever. It's a long time. Isn't it? That's a long time. And uh, Paul, and then Psalms there, 105 there, it says, The foundations of this earth are for sure and shall never be removed henceforth and forever. Now, when is this, when is this renovation by fire going to take That'd place? That would be at the end of the millennial reign. It's uh, purifying the heavens and the earth, renovating everything of a sinful nature will be abolished. Now, John puts it this way in Revelation, the first heaven, the first earth passed away. 
Now, we're not to understand their ceasing to exist. We must remember we passed away. We passed from death unto life. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. So it is with this earth. Good thought. Excellent. If you go back and study the original there, it's not cessation, not ceasing to exist, but it's actually passing from one condition to another because your other scriptures teaches that this is an eternal planet and will always be. What is that Greek word there meaning to pass from one condition to another? Para, para, mochea, somebody help me. Well, I can't speak Chinese right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the, mean, the meaning of it is being changed, renovated, purified. Does it mean annihilation or no, cessation? No, no, never ceasing to exist. It's changed what, from one that, condition to yes. another. Is that what Jesus meant when he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away? Pass from one condition to another. No such thing as heavens and earth passing away. Those are eternal planets will always be. No such thing as them ceasing to exist. No, that's right. All right, now, now, I know that you've explained this half a million times, I guess, without much exaggeration there, but uh, some of the people will be thinking just a moment. Now, when this earth catches on fire and God promised he would not destroy it again by water, the next time he would renovate it by fire, uh, what's going to happen to all the glorified saints and the natural people that are on this earth during that transformation time there? Well, actually, to the saints, it wouldn't matter because by that time you have a glorified body. Right. And uh, we're insured against hail, fire, storms, floods, everything when you get that glorified <laughs> body. You're okay. not subject to that. Now, as to the natural people, <clears throat> how are they going to get over on the new earth? Right. From the millennium, right, right after the millennium, you have your renovation. How are they going to make it over on this new planet Earth after the Earth is renovated? How are they going to be preserved through that fire? Well, we, we cite you back to an Old Testament instance where there was three Hebrew children wouldn't bow to an image, and for it they were thrown in a fiery furnace. And I like this part of the story. The Bible said the fire reached out and licked up those strong men. That bunch of devils had it coming, bind those innocent boys and throw them in a fiery furnace, and the fire reached out and licked up those strong men, but it never hurt those boys in the fiery furnace. Not even to the hair of their head was singed. And their garments, only one thing burned, and that was the ropes, the bands they tied them with. God wants his people lifting the holy hands and worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And God preserved that group right on through it so he can do the same thing. He's the one that's doing the renovating, and he can preserve them right through and take them over in the new earth. There'll be no problem. Is there any scriptural reference as to how long this renovation is going no, to take? No, there isn't. No, it doesn't say how long it'll be. Mm -hmm. Okay, but immediately following will then come the new earth, as we use that term, the, the, the changed earth, the, right, the, the new condition earth. The renewed earth, yes. Okay, now yes. let's uh, explain to the people what that earth is going to look like and what it'll be like. Well, actually, to be the best of everything, and it's there where God moves his headquarters, from heaven down on this earth, and God will dwell among mankind, and they shall see God face to face. He'll be right here in person. In fact, at the Christ's second coming, he will come back with Christ. But over there, he moves his headquarters from heaven to earth. Now, here's a city 600 miles around it, 1,500 miles square, 1,500 miles to the highest peak of it. It has walls of jasper, gates of pearl, streets of gold. It has the best of everything. If you notice there, God goes first class. There's deluxe route all the way, the best of everything. Now, I guess that's a little bit why Paul said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for those that love him. That's the thing I like about this, uh, uh, these, all these buildings and everything. It's first class, nothing cheap around here. Because God may must I, be the head of it. Let me ask an unnecessary question. What would it make any difference? If this present world was exploded and burned up and destroyed, why, why does it have to be the same earth? Is there any reason for that? Why, why well, couldn't, Peter says it'll be dissolved, it'll burn up. What, what would it make any difference? Whether well, he just made a new one. Well, he this? could, he could, but you've got your other scriptures saying it's eternal. It won't pass away. And Paul said it'll be changed. It'll be folded up and shall be changed, but thou art the same and thy years shall not fail. So, so actually, the, the thought is it's going to be changing. And Paul said some things cannot be shaken. Now, some things are going to remain, going to stand the test and go right through. He's not going to burn up everything. He'll burn the things of a sinful nature, destroy all the works of the enemy, 
And therefore, we'll have a renewed earth and a renewed heaven. Could it have anything to do with what Satan did in coming down to take over the possessions of the prince of the power of the air? Well, that's a good thought. All that will be destroyed. Oh, yes. All that will be cleansed and purified. The well, now, in this new age to come, in this, this, it, it'll, be, it'll be a time without end. Correct? Right. And forever and forever. Time, ages with age without end. Uh, you're saying then, the Bible says, God will, will bring his headquarters, the new Jerusalem. That's what John was talking about when he, when he said, uh, and I, John, 21st chapter, second verse, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And, and this new Jerusalem, 1500 miles square, will come down from God out of heaven and will set up on this earth to stay forever. Right. And God will move his headquarters from planet heaven to planet earth. Is that correct? That's correct. And the glorified saints, plus all of those natural people that were in the millennial reign, that did not turn their back on the Lord, that lived for him, will come over into the perfect age. Right. And the glorified will live in that city. Now, Paul said, first, uh, first Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood won't inherit that. That's for the glorified. Oh, okay. Matthew 5 now says the meek will inherit the earth. I got the you. natural people will live on the earth, and going into that 23rd verse, 24th verse, the nations of those that are saved will come in and out of the city and do bring their glory and honor into it. But actually, the glorified will live in that city. That's our eternal home. Okay, I, I, I don't know if there is an answer to this, but uh, it's why would God want to move his headquarters from heaven to earth? Well, he evidently loves us. He is, uh, speaking of Christ, his delight was with the sons of men. And God loves his people. He, he loves this earth. And uh, so uh, all the why, why he's moving it down here. Now, heaven will still be heaven up yes. there. You can run up there to heaven if you want to go back and forth and all that. But actually, he will dwell right here, and they'll see God face to face. They Could don't... it be, excuse me, I'm breaking no, I'm sorry. Could it be that uh, this is, and this was passing through my mind, Brother Swagger, since Satan has usurped the authority of this world and held supremacy over humanity and nations, could it be that God is proving the final authority back on this world in utter supremacy again? That's a good talk. He loves the earth. He visited a man in the Garden of Eden. He was proud of his work. Everything was good. You know, John, when you, when you said that, I... I um we all know, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, et cetera, et cetera. When you said that, I, I sense the presence of the Lord. I, uh, I don't know why God would love us. I really don't know. I have no idea. There are times that I think that there's not much here that's lovable. But I guess that's what makes, makes God different yeah. than the human race yeah. that he has created. And he didn't create us evil. That came about because of the fall. But um, God loved us when we were unlovable. And in spite of failure, faults, and problems, but he is making of himself, as what the scripture says, one new man, or right. what, what's the correct terminology? Is that it? Yes. And he's making a new creature, one new man. And... It's the, the faults, the failures, the problems, the difficulties one day will be done away with. Right. Completely and totally. And for God to love this world enough to, to send his son to die on Calvary, that was even greater than him moving his headquarters. Yes. Here. Right. Yeah. So I guess we have our own answer there. And you we? have to remember, too, we're made in his image after his likeness. And he liked us so much that he made us in his image. Okay, I, I, want, I want you to explain that because there is some misunderstanding in respect to that particular scripture. Some say, well, that, whenever we, that was only a spiritual image and meant nothing else. Well, that's false because uh, Genesis 1, 26, let us make man our own image after our likeness. That word image is the Hebrew word tisalem. It means shape, form, statue, figure, resemblance. The same Hebrew word is used in Genesis 5 where Adam begot a son after his image, after his likeness. And while Jesus was here on this earth, he says, I'm the express image of his person. And Romans 1.20, he said, For the invisible things of him are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. There's something in this earth that looks like God. We naturally go back to Genesis and study about mankind made in God's image after his likeness. So, That's us. so you're saying that God has a body. Right. He Paul has, speaks about He spirit. has a body, has a shape, has, has a, a spirit form, body. Has a spirit body, right. Paul speaks about that in Second Corinthians 3, the last two or three verses. We are changed into his image from glory unto glory. By the Spirit within us, it's transforming the church, the believer, the body of Christ into it. Oh, okay, but that, that's a little more spiritualistic. That, that's, that's on the spiritual side. Yeah. Well, it right. is, but don't you think that it really applies to the fact that uh, it, even through us physically, there's well, a transformation that's, to his that's image? Good, that's good thinking. But, okay, but whenever, whenever it says in the Bible that men saw God, when Daniel describes the Lord and says his hair was white, and, and you'll have to help me with that, that long word, Many say that that's what? Anthropomorphic? Is that the word? That it's just uh, uh, trying to explain God to poor finite minds and it doesn't really mean God has white hair. Is that the, what they're, the term? So uh, explain that. Did, did Daniel really see a figure sitting on a throne with white hair and does God have white hair? Oh, I think so. He evidently <laughs> does. Brother Miller would agree with that pretty quick. <laughs> you and I might be a little slow, but we'll... but anyway, Lord help us. <laughs> Exodus thirty three eleven. Moses spake unto God face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now Moses saw him and talked with him. When you talk to your friends, you don't talk through a keyhole or a crack of a door. You talk to your friends face to face. Now dropping down to the eighteenth verse of that same chapter, Exodus thirty three. Moses said, Now I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now let me see in your glory and your power. And he said, Moses, no man can see my face and live. You can't see me in all of my glory and power and attributes. Now, uh, you have going back there to Cain. Cain said, From thy face I shall be hid. You have Adam and Eve visiting with him in the cool of the day. Uh, God visited them in the cool of the day. You have Abraham having dinner one day, having God for lunch, killed a fatted calf and all of that. And Isaiah 1, 6 said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Daniel spoke about it. And Daniel tells us what he looked like. He said his hair was white and uh, his, uh, looked this way and that way and tells us uh, about his shape. Now, it's silly to say that uh, they told us about his shape and he doesn't have a shape. That's, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. Told us that his hair was white and he don't have any hair. That, uh, that's beyond my understanding. Now, John 1, 18 where no man's seen God at any time. You have to harmonize that with the other scriptures where they did see God, did talk to God, and the word seen is comprehend. No man comprehended God, seen him in all of his glory and power and attributes. And I like to tell that audience out there, you'll fall short of an understanding of God if you only go to John 4, 24, and that's all you know about God, which said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, you will fall way short of a knowledge of God. And really, if you read it in another translation, God is spiritual, and they that worship him must be spiritual, is the thought there. I don't remember if that was our original question or not. I think we started off on the image. But some, but some, excuse me, Jim, some people take that scripture and try to make it mean that he's a will of a wisp, just use yes. a voice out of a, yeah. out of a, out of a cloud or something. But that's, you, you put a little different light on it, Jim. Well, Hope, you're talking about God and his glory, and you've mentioned the new Jerusalem, and the gates will be open, and the people will go in all the time to worship him. Now, is the natural man on the earth going to be able to see God in all of his glory? Yes, Is he going to set on his glory? Oh, yeah, Revelation 22, they shall see God face to face. The natural people will see him. Well, all these people we're talking about is natural people. They've seen him, talked with him, visit with him. You're talking about like Abraham yes, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, they saw so. him and talked with him. But he said to Moses, you can't see me in my glory, but these people will be able to see him in the glory. Oh, yeah, later on. Oh, yeah, later on we'll be able to see him in his glory and power and attributes. Did, right? did, did you attend seminary? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do they teach in seminary? <laughs> <laughs> they teach that God does not have a form. Has no form or shape. No form or shape. Yes. <laughs> Just like otherwise, a... otherwise, you'd have God of being put in a statue or something that you can worship. And God says, nobody's going to see my face, otherwise they're going to put me in a idol and mm -hmm. worship me. Okay, what is your rebuttal to that? Just the uh, opposite of that, because uh, Jesus... <laughs> 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 Jesus said, no man's seen his shape. You haven't seen his shape. You haven't seen him. No. You haven't seen him at all. 
But so, is that saying he doesn't have a shape no, or he does have that one? That says he does have a shape. He couldn't have one if he didn't, if he wouldn't have said that. He, he didn't say you haven't seen a shape because he has no shape. He does have a shape. He has a form. He has it. And the, the word image, that's what they don't like. They, they shy away from that word image. But if you study that word image, the Hebrew tesalim, it means shape, form, stature, figure, resemblance. Mm-hmm. We're made in his image after his life. Okay, well, what is the difference, Dr. Sequeira? And we're talking about a body. We all the time think of, of a body just like we have, flesh, blood, bone. But a spirit body, is there? It, does a spirit body do violence to the Scripture? So do you have God with big muscles, his arm of the Lord that raised me up? Do we talk about... Well, that uh, is an anthropomorphic statement. Well, wait, well, what is it? Is it going to be literal or anthropomorphic? Well, we all use we all use uh, statements of that nature. I you, agree, but I'm saying if you put it all in one, and you got to fit the pattern all the way through, if we're going to be consistent. Not really. Well, I. Not really. I understand, but I there's, there's some problems with it. Okay, go ahead, John. I'm well, listening. he has <laughs> <laughs> he has hands, he has a face, he has hair, has eyes, he has all of that. Rides in the chariot. Rides in a chair, right? Sits down and eats. Ate with Abraham. Visit with him. All of that. But a spiritual body don't have to do the things that you and I think of. He doesn't have to eat to keep going. But the, he did. He did there. He visited with him. Now, when it comes to Christ, he's the express image of his person. Now, how, how would you explain that? if he didn't go back to the word image and study the word image and really what it means. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen what he'd do. I'm the express image of his person. Mm -hmm. Then the invisible thing, see, we understand the invisible by the visible. In order to understand the invisible, you've got to look at the visible. So the invisible things... That's Romans 1, isn't it? Huh? Yes. Romans 1. Yeah, 21, 21. Uh, the, um, to understand the invisible, you look at the visible. So the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And there's something here that looks like God. You wouldn't think of an animal out here. you think of God's highest type of creation. That's why he likes us. We're made in his image after his likeness. As a father pitied his son, God pitied those that love him. Okay, what does it. the seminary teach that we will see when we get to glory? <clears throat> see Christ. And that's the only one. That's the image. But there will be other words. When Daniel saw uh, Christ sitting by God the Father on the throne, he saw two. Okay, there. so okay, so then what we have then is two actual physical bodies. So no. the Trinity then becomes two physical bodies. Is that what we're saying? Physical. Uh, I mean spiritual bodies. Spiritual two bodies. spiritual bodies. What did Daniel see then? He saw the Ancient of Days. The Bible says. I know, but what did he see? If it was not God on that throne. And the and and uh, one likened to the Son of God by his side. Who who did he see? He saw a vision. <laughs> a vision of what? Of God. Okay. All righty. And but but what I'm I'm trying to get what most seminaries teach. Do they teach? Most seminaries would teach that God does not have form. Um, it does not have a body. Yeah, I understand form. that, but I'm trying to get at at, at in, in the eternal ages to come. There will be only Christ. They teach. Is that right? Basically, yes. Well, that's not yes, much. That's, that's, that's not much difference in, in oneness, Doctor. That, that's exactly what the oneness teach. They believe that that Jesus came on the earth and He is the one we'll see, but the Father and the Spirit are manifestations of the one. Of the one. Uh, doc, you mean Doctor Square? They say that when we get to heaven, we'll only see one. Well, we'll see. For instance, it's like seeing the sun. You see the you. S- no one can see the essence of the sun and live, and survive naturally. So we'll see the brightness of God in his glory, in his full splendor, but not in the sense of a person, as an actual person. Then there'll be a God and God the Father and God the Son, but it will not be in the terms of a of a spiritual body, whatever body that might be. And they do they do not view him as fellowshipping and all of this type with with his people? Not in that sense. Okay, whenever, whenever uh, the Bible says in Genesis, what is it, Genesis 18, that the Lord reigned fire and brimstone from the Lord from out the of Lord heaven. Out what, of what, were they, what were they talking about there? The power of God. It's the, it's the, but they were not talking about to let us make man in our own image. Yes, no, it's a trinity. But yeah. it's not, and not in the sense of two distinct or three distinct bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, you think in terms of Jesus was born of the Spirit. Right, the Bible, he conceived of the Holy Ghost. 
Well, who was his father? Was it the Holy Ghost or was it the Father? I think the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit was his father, but the Bible says he was his father. His father was his father, and yet the Bible says it was his father. Well, well Holy that's Spirit. not quite correct what I said. But yeah. his father, he was, he was, uh, give us the I'm, correct terminology. Back there. to this, I'm familiar with that book here. A lot of those, that book pretty much is used too. I studied that same book. A lot of the statements I still remember, God has no form, no shape, and uh, nobody ever tried to prove the existence of God. They said no prophet or anybody ever tried to prove the existence of God. Now, when I was studying that as a student, I didn't believe it. One of the teachers believed it, and another one didn't believe it. I didn't believe it, because I read immediately where Malachi and others said, prove me herewith, and God says, prove me herewith. And they said, oh, God wouldn't be a God if he could be proven. I read that same book, and studied it three years, I believe, in school, two or three years, whatever it was, and I taught taught those same subjects, but I taught contrary to that one particular book, Great Doctrines of the Bible. And so uh, it, it taught that stuff. Now, and I didn't believe it at all and still don't believe it today. I believe there's a real, literal being known of as God, has a body, has a form, has a shape. Jesus is the express image. We're made in his image and all that. And I believe all three persons of the Godhead has a form and a shape. The Holy, the Holy Spirit, Holy Holy Spirit too. has a body. Right. Have you got time for this? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a minute and a half. And Dr. Above Dr. The, Sequeira says he's glad he's on the end. <laughs> and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, that's Ezekiel, the first chapter. A throne, the appearance of a man upon it. Appearance of a man. Okay, I, would that be anthropomorphic, Dr. Square, of what they teach? Yes. In other words, it, 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 Ezekiel... God, in other words, God can manifest himself in any form he chooses. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spirit can manifest himself in any form he chooses, but does not himself possess a complete form, forever, uh, forever spiritual body. Okay. So when Daniel said his body was like this, he really didn't mean that. Any more than he means the everlasting arms are underneath me. Does it well, mean his, that God his, is holding me up? His arms are everlasting and his power and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> they are everlasting. Thank God for that. All right. We don't want to get back into what we were in. We'll leave that, we'll leave that be. And we, we do want to discuss something that I think, and I've taken advantage of Dr. Hall because he's, he's an authority, in, in my opinion, in these subjects. And even though we deviated a little bit, we'll get back to it Monday, incidentally, what we were on, what constitutes a good church, and so forth. These are areas, though, that I felt we should take advantage of while uh, John was here with us. I preached camp meetings with him for years, and uh, uh, I've always enjoyed his teaching so very, very, very much. And learned an awful lot from the Word of God, uh, of the Word of God, from him. May I just interject here yes, to the people that are listening? Certainly. That if they're attending a church that's not at least getting a pretty good foundation in what's being taught on this, they need to really consider carefully whether they should stay in that church or not. The sad thing is, Glenn, most people attending churches, they don't even know anything about the new birth, much less well, I know that. what the future of Bible prophecy is, but you're exactly right, right on target. All right, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we want to discuss uh, the pre-Adamic creation. We want to discuss the origin of Satan. Uh, Lucifer, we want to, to discuss what is referred to as the gap theory between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Many of you may wonder, how old is this world? Is it just 6,000 years old? Some are saying today in fundamentalist circles that that's how old it is, 6,000 years old. Is that correct? Um, or maybe is it millions of years old? Some of the uh, geologists tell us it could be a billion years old or a half a trillion years old or whatever the case may be. And... Uh, is that correct? Uh, does the Bible really address itself to these things? Uh, was Adam and Eve the first people on this earth? Or were there people here or a creation here before Adam and Eve? Uh, we want to discuss that. In Ezekiel chapter 28, 13th verse, it tells us, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And I'll just stop right there. It doesn't seem to be too much that we've said, but it does say an awful lot. It speaks volumes when you get down to the to the final conclusion of that particular scripture. Uh, John, let's go back to Genesis one one and one two. Um, 
I'd like you to answer that. Is, is it your thought that the earth is only 6,000 years old, or is it much older? And explain Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, please. In Genesis, the first chapter, you read this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that takes you back into the dateless past. <clears throat> How old the earth is, no one actually knows. And the scripture you quoted from Ezekiel there concerning Lucifer it goes on to say, Thou was perfect in all of thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thine heart. And thou hast been in the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering. Now, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 goes back to the original perfect earth, and that's the earth that Lucifer one time ruled and reigned in. When God created the earth, he created it beautiful, created it perfect. Isaiah 45 and 18 says he created it not in vain. The word vain is tohu, means desolate and empty. He didn't create it desolate and empty. He created it beautiful, created it to be inhabited, it says there. And Lucifer and his subjects ruled and reigned on this original perfect earth. Isaiah 14, 12 it teaches his downfall. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? For thou didst say in thy heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, the 17th verse there brings you back to Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and he says, He made the world to become as a wilderness, and, this, and in which did us weaken the nations, destroyed the cities thereof. And going back to Genesis 1 and 2, And the earth was without form and void. That word was is the Hebrew word, H-A-V-A-H, and it means became. The earth became without form and void. The usage of it, uh, God breathed into the nostrils of man. Man became a living soul. So when the earth was created, created beautiful, created to be inhabited, Lucifer inhabited back there, led his forces into heaven, met his defeat, cast out. Then the earth was cursed, as you have in Genesis 1 and 2, and was without form and void. Now, going back to Adam and Eve, the earth is uh, 6,000 years old. But going back to the original there, it could be into the millions of years old. We don't know. And scientists could be right when they tell us that it's millions of years old. But now, we have some <clears throat> fundamentalists today that, that and I, I get a lot of the reports, that are really trying to say that uh, the earth is only 6,000 years old and the dinosaurs and things of this nature were before the flood. Do you subscribe to... No, I don't. You can't, uh, you can't teach the six days saying that's the original perfect earth, that's everything. Because Lucifer had 6, already, years. yeah, six thousand years. You can't go back and say that because Lucifer had already become a devil when he entered in the garden to tempt the new rulers of this earth. When did the devil have a throne? When did he ascend into heaven? When did he try to overthrow God? It certainly was way before this, because here's where he entered in the garden to tempt the new rulers of this planet Earth. Then in Genesis 1:28, the Bible says, "Multiply and replenish." The word "replenish" means restore, refill, repopulate, re-inhabit. And uh, it means to replenish of its own type and origin. Then Isaiah fourteen seventeen, speaking of Lucifer there, which did is weaken the nations and destroyed the cities thereof. So there were inhabitants on this earth before Adam and Eve. What were they? Well, uh, a lot of people teach some of the greatest scholars I've ever read after. In fact, Dake's Annotated Bible teaches it, that, uh, that the actually people lived on the earth before the flood that the word replenish means replenish of its own type and origin. Now, I do not teach it for the lack of sufficient plain scriptures to back it up. They got Isaiah 14, 17. They got Genesis 1, 28. I do not teach it for the lack of sufficient plain scriptures to make it easy for the public to understand. I teach it the, uh, Lucifer rule back there. The angels was with him. Third part of the angels rebelled with him. Not saying I don't believe it. I believe a lot of things I don't teach. I've never believed, uh, Dr. Miller, that it was Peter's intention to cut Malchus' servant's ear off there in the garden. Now, I've never believed that. People talk about that story, and I don't believe it. Well, you think I believe he's trying he to cut to, off his head? I believe he meant to hit the old boy right between the eyes, and he jerked his head and got his ear, and I can't prove it, so I don't teach it. So there's a lot of things I believe I don't teach. <laughs> okay. Brother, Brother Hall, where is the caveman? Do you believe there was a caveman? Could he have been that uh, creature? Now, I know nothing of the cavemen, really, uh, as far as chapter and verse. They've, you got them today, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, where did the dinosaurs come from? Well, they would, they would really have to come in on the original perfect earth. If you're gonna, 
if you're going to believe in dinosaurs and trinosaurs and all that, it's hard to deny not believing in them when you go down and see the bones of those creatures. I teach you'd have to put them back on the original perfect earth since they haven't existed on the earth since the days of Adam and Eve. And what? scientists teach, scientists teach about their bones being millions of years old and all that, and you can't do that going back to Genesis. And you say they can be right. That could be correct. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. But they have discovered a dinosaur in a man's foot at the same place. Well, that would just verify what I said. Man could have lived back on the original perfect earth with the dinosaur. Okay, is it possible that, uh, I guess it would be possible that they could have come at different times. Okay, do they have ways of ascertaining? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, but, but yes, I have read that. They have, that's that's also knocking in the head some of the evolution stuff. Oh, absolutely. That, that's that's coming about. Well, a know. death blow to evolution is everything reproduced after its after kind, after its kind mm -hmm. not you involved or something. Well, yeah. Okay, now, so we, we're saying that the Bible teaches that there was a pre-Adamic creation, whatever they looked like. Right. Okay, what happened to that creation? Well, that was the overthrow of Lucifer's kingdom when the earth was cursed, overflowed with water. You see, they have discovered today, digging into the earth, uh, in fact, the coal fields, they bring things out of those coal beds way back in the mountains, showing forms of things, showing that this earth sometime has undergone a change in its history. Right. And that's it. We go back to Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, uh, so go ahead, Glenn. Well... In this, considering this present creation as we know it, and I'm teaching a little bit on this uh, on uh, Sundays at 8.30 here, but uh, didn't Job say something about renewing the face of the earth? David said that in Psalm 104 about renewing the face of the earth. And then in Isaiah, is it Isaiah 43, 45, you, you remember, he said he made the earth to be inhabited. He renewed it to be inhabited. 45, 18. 45, 18. But he talks about renewing the face of the earth, which would say that it, that it was something that was already there, that he came back to renew it. Well, uh, Jeremiah 4.23, see, he looked back on that scene. He said, I beheld the earth as it was, the hills moved lightly, the birds of the heavens had fled, and there was no man. And lo, behold, the fruitful places had become as a wilderness. That's showing the chaotic condition, how the earth was overthrown. The apostle Peter made an interesting statement. He said, this they're willingly ignorant of. Well, now, isn't that the same passage that's in um, Jeremiah 4.23? Also in Genesis, or it uses some of the same terminology. Same terminology in Genesis, same thing. Yeah, right. All referring to the overthrow of Lucifer's kingdom there and how it became a chaotic condition. Where it says the earth was without form and void. Right. It's the same terminology. Same terminology referring to the same thing. And Peter said, this they're willingly ignorant of, that the heavens and the earth which were of old. But that, that would be where they got that man. He said, I saw no man. Jeremiah said, I You're saw right, no man. Right. Right. I assume that's where he. That's where he got. But you're yeah. saying the earth was destroyed, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. You're saying the earth was destroyed in that day by a flood. Right. Uh, by a flood, overflowing waters. Now that's not Lucifer's flood. That's that's a different flood there. That's a, this is the original flood back there, going back to Genesis one and two, where the earth was cursed and overflowed with darkness and water covered the face of the deep. And then the six and how long it remained in that condition, we don't know. And there's where you have the the scriptures coming in, uh, the six days of recreation, restoring the earth back to its beauty. But if if uh, there had never been anything here and the earth was only 6,000 years old, the word plenish would have been used instead of replenish. That's right. That's right. Of course, the, those who argue against that, they say, well, in the Hebrew, it means to fill up. It means, uh, means uh, sure, it means fill up again. <clears throat> it, was, it was full before. Right. Okay. All righty. In that case of the uh, second verse, the earth without form and void, does this, in the 12th chapter of Isaiah, uh, 14th chapter of Isaiah, speaking of Satan, Mm -hmm. we, we get that reference there. I will five times exalt himself against the throne. Then it says, uh, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the earth. And then he mentions that made the world as a wilderness. He, he made it to become as a wilderness due to his rebellion. And destroyed the cities, right. It, and which did us weaken the nations, it says there. Right, too. it does. So there's nations. Brother Hall, what reference does the rainbow have in Noah's flood when he gave him a sign that he would not destroy it again? Are you feeling that he had a... He gave us a sign they would not destroy it again because he destroyed it twice? Or, Well, really, it's not the first appearance of the rainbow. Zika 128, the appearance of the bow, always in the time of rain. So they had rains before that time. 
But God took the rainbow there and made a covenant by the rainbow, He by the already existing rainbow. He made a covenant that he wouldn't destroy the earth anymore with water, but he will with fire. Okay, so what we're saying here is this, that there is a gap, right? Yes. Between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Definitely. Some of the greatest scholars, Brother Swaggart, in the world teach that gap theory. Yes, I, I, would, I know As so. As you well know. And uh, that we really don't know from the Bible when the earth was created, when the scientists or the geologists or whomever say it was created a million years ago or a billion or ten billion, they may be right, they That's may right. be wrong, but they, it's, it's nothing in Scripture that would violate that particular statement. Uh, I, I don't think it's correct when someone says the earth was uh, created 6,000 years ago. I think the evolutionists will beat your head in on that one. I don't think that's right. I think it was created a long time ago, and the prehistoric monsters that we dig up their remains came from the pre-Adamic creation, back there before the earth was destroyed by water. And uh, when it says in Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was without form and void, it became that way as a result of a revolution led by Satan. That's right. Satan once governed this world in righteousness and holiness and purity under God and uh, governed a creation. He wouldn't just govern nothing, would he? Yeah, wouldn't, right. it wouldn't be any point to it. So he governed something. So there was something here that he governed. And uh, <clears throat> he led a revolution against God when it was, no one knows, eons of ages ago. He steals, kills, destroys. This is when evil came into the to the system, into uh, this this earth, and into the angelic host as well. And uh, if you want to know what sin will do, all you have to do is look at Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form That's and right. void. That's what sin will do to a life, a heart, a dream, a marriage, a home, a nation, or anything else. It will destroy it completely, totally. And so Satan was once Lucifer, the mighty angel under God, created by God, who sealed up the sun, full of wisdom and beauty, and maybe the highest, I'll ask you to answer this, do you think that Satan, then Lucifer, was before the fall the mightiest angel ever created by God, mightier than maybe Michael or Gabriel? Well, he was the outstanding leader, Brother Swigert, and uh, his wisdom was corrupted there after he fell. And uh, I would say he was the leader. He was the he was the mighty. Well, angel. the Bible said, "Is it Jude that Michael does not bring against him a railing accusation?" Right, right. <clears throat> and it, it, would that be because that that Lucifer outranked him, even though one was on one side, and one the other? Possibly yeah, so. At anyway. least equal rank. Do, at, at least, least equal. equal rank. At yes. least, least Good equal. Thought. Yes. Good thought. Good thought. At yes. least equal rank. Uh, but it uses the, the the statement in Ezekiel twenty eight that he sealed up the sum meaning that, that uh, there was nothing else could be done to make him more beautiful and powerful. Is that the meaning of that passage? Yeah, he's a, he was a beautiful being. The devil was a beautiful being. And through thy beauty, thine heart was lifted up. Uh, people think they're going to see the devil with horns and a pitchfork and a long tail when uh, the Bible don't give that description of him. That's on that little devil ham stuff <laughs> and other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so don't go for that uh, being the exact picture of Satan because he's a, he was a beautiful being. Glenn, uh, people are often asking, where does sin come from? It goes past the garden, doesn't it? It goes yes. on back to yes. Satan. Yes. And it goes back to the will of a person. Or of, a of, a cre of a creature. That's where sin is originated, in the rebellious will against God. It's the basic sin in it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, all right, I want to close this program today. It's, it's, this is, some of you will have never heard of this, and some of you will have heard of it. And boy, this is where sides are drawn rapidly. <laughs> it's this. It's found in Genesis 6, chapter 1, verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants, fourth verse, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown, etc., etc., etc. You can read it for yourself there. All right, there are maybe many teachings on this particular subject, but two that I'm uh, very well acquainted with. And one is that 
these were the two lines, the line of what? Line of Cain and line of Seth, Seth uh -huh. and that the daughters of Seth, uh, Cain married the daughters of Seth, which were godly and produced some type of race of giants. The other teaching is that corrupted angels, we, we've been talking about Lucifer's fall and how that one third of the angels threw in their lot with him, isn't that correct? Yes. Sided with him in the revolution that he led against God in the eons of ages of the past. And that resulted in this earth being without form and void and uh, so forth and so on. And that, that some of those angels that fell with him saw the daughters of men and um, came down and took uh, them wives of all which they chose. And the result of that union was a race of giants. It took place two times on this earth, once before the flood and once after the flood. Now, which one is right, John? Well, I'd say your last statements are, which evidently I think you believe that it was the angels. That yes. Came, fallen angels came down. I do, but a lot don't. I know it. Uh, how well do I know it? <laughs> I've just canceled out several meetings right now. <laughs> so, well, anyway, part of those fallen angels intermarried with the daughters of men. Now, it says in the first verse, he came to pass when men begin to multiply. That goes right back to Adam and Eve. Daughters were born unto them. Just because Cain and Abel sang aloud here doesn't mean they didn't have any daughters. According to tradition, Adam had 46 children, 23 sons, 23 daughters. Well, anyway, the, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, saw that they were fair, and took unto the wives of all they chose. Now, for committing such sins, Second Peter 2, 4, the Bible says they're bound in Tartus, in hell. That's a different place than hell that we, that we know about. That's a special place for those angels that committed such sin there. He's cast down in chains of darkness to be reserved. Now, Jude, the sixth and seventh verses, teaches there that the angels kept not their first state, left their own habitation he hath reserved in chains of darkness. And the seventh verse says, uh, leaving, uh, going after strange flesh or set forth for an example. And there'd be nothing strange in a man and woman getting married. There's nothing strange about that. That's natural. And so, but these giants, uh, these children were giants. Now, a Christian marrying a sinner does not produce giants. The old, some of the old teaching there that Seth's sons married Cain's daughters and their children were giants. That's contrary to all scripture. Because the Bible said the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the believing husband or else your children would be born out of wedlock, would be legitimately born if that marriage is not recognized. So people have normal children. Uh, they don't have giants. But those are giants. And actually, those giants have no resurrection. There's something different about those those creatures because they have no resurrection. Their memories made to perish. They shall not arise. So their memories made, they, they've been deceased off the earth. God raised up, uh, sent the flood to destroy them. And then later raised up Israel to destroy them off the face of the earth. So we teach that it was the fallen angels intermarried the purpose to corrupt the pure Adamite stock to prevent the seed of the woman, Christ, from coming into the world. No purpose of it, Dave, so they wouldn't be doing it today. This, you're right. He's already come. Right. This, this, was the, this was the total plan That's of Satan it. and this eruption of these giants as a result of a union of angels and women. And um, uh, what, that was to, to corrupt the whole human race, and there would be no one through whom the Christ could the come. The pure Adamite stock would be corrupted, but so, God outsmarted him on every mm. occasion. So when the Bible said that Noah was perfect in his generation, it's not really speaking of spiritual perfection. It's talking about perfection in the line of, of, a, of a pure generation. He was that perfect Adamite stock. He was not, his family had not been corrupted by a, a false right, union of, right. of giants and, and, I mean, angels and, and women. Okay, two questions. Help me. Uh, and Glenn and I have argued over this for seven have. years now. Yeah, so. I you know, I want to believe it, and I, and I am believing it. I'm accepting it, but I'm not comfortable with it. And so I'm just saying I'm believing it. Can angel, Are there any angel can still procreate? Are there angels that could procreate with a woman? Well, they could, but there's no purpose for it now. There's no cause for it. Well, would that, if there were, if there were angels that He's would do He's meaning it, physically, is it possible? Physically, yeah. Be. yeah. If there were angels that did that in those days, why couldn't there be angels do that now? There day? could, but on the other hand, the punishment that follows it, those angels were bound in, in Tartus, they were chained, and they're going to be dealt with altogether different than the others are. So there's not any of those about to do that. In other words, the Lord put the fear of God in them. Is right. that what you're saying? Right. A film no, in the past, Rosemary's Baby, had just that. They call it Incubus, the uniting of a devil with a okay. with a woman. It came out in a, in a movie house. Yeah. I, I, Another question that troubles you've me. You've got a minute, Glenn. Oh, 
did all the seed of angels who conceived after the flood, every bit of that seed, has it been wiped out? Uh, yes. They conceived and bore children. Did all of that seed? That, that's one wiped? of the reasons, excuse me if I don't mean to answer yeah. for you, but that's one of the reasons God said kill them all. I know, yeah, that's right. what, living, but was there, I mean, all that seed and procreating yeah, and were, having other seed, everything in that in that They were destroyed, killed. completely wiped out. There could be none off. of that seed carried on no. into this. Oh, you that's right, I hear people out there saying, but I know Jesus mm -hmm. said that we'll be as angels in heaven, neither married them. Well, he's, he's talking about the continuation of the race, not uh, of the sex. Okay. Is that right? Just, I, well, see, angels never marry among themselves. No, they don't have to. And so yeah. we'll be as the angels, because angels never marry among themselves, but that would not refute Genesis 6. There, but there right? are no female angels. No. Oh, no. in the masculine. Yeah, all right. We, we've run out of time, and uh, thank you so much for having been with us. I pray we've, we've taken you into some areas that, uh, that at least is interesting and would have been a blessing. If it comes from this book, it's interesting. It's right. that simple. Amen. Interesting. It's right. that simple. Amen. Interesting. It's right. that simple. Amen. Interesting. It's right. that simple. Amen.